we're off to the races. Stuart Cooper, what's happening, brother? Not much, man. Just having a good time out here in Phuket, Thailand. Dude, it is hot as absolute shit. How yeah. long have you been living here? So I've been coming here on and off since 2012, but I recently moved back in February. Uh, so after spending one year in Singapore. That's pretty hot too, right, in Singapore? Singapore, yeah. But Singapore is a very indoor culture, so you're not really outside much. You're always inside in a shopping mall or uh, you know, inside air, air conditioning. Everything's here outdoors in, here. Everything's outdoors here, yeah. So it, it's, it's more humid in Singapore, but it's hotter here in Phuket, I think. Yeah, it's definitely, feel like for the week that I've been here, the, the culture shock hasn't been anything but the heat. And I mean, I'm from Cairns originally, which is like North Queensland, which is known for being hot. But like, dude, I'm on, I've been on Struggle Street all week. Like I, we were training at um, the camp with Lockie. I, I don't think I've got a, like a legit cramp where like your whole muscle just seizes up and it just won't let go. Probably for like 10 years. And the second day we were there, because like, I wasn't drinking a bunch of like electrolytes and shit. Yeah. And then I was just like my whole leg locked up and I was like, holy shit. So just goes to show it, it looks like when you finish training that you've just got out of the shower. Yeah. Yeah. It's like every single session you have to take, um, you have to drink two of those electrolyte packs every single day. Yeah. You know, maybe more. Yeah, it's, it's hard to stay hydrated out here and you forget to drink sometimes. It's very important when you're training, mm. you know, to keep hydrated. Because you lose a lot of water. Mm, yeah, no, it's it's even like um, just the, the food side of things. Like we were eating so much and I was getting skinnier. And I was eating more than, way, way more than I normally do. And like those big protein shakes after every session. So it's, it's yeah. definitely no joke. You can see why people come and do camps. So actually, I guess we should backtrack for people that are just listening. We're actually at uh, Tiger Muay Thai in Phuket, Thailand. Um, Stewie is a jiu-jitsu coach here, um, but you're more famously known for Stuart Cooper films, which I've, I watched a, a few of your stuff when I first got into jiu-jitsu. Um, and then when I kind of found out that you were living here and training here, I thought I'd hit you up because I, from what I can tell, you've almost got like a bit of a parallel kind of lifestyle or like a timeline, I guess, to kind of how I got started, but in a, in a different sport, I guess. Yeah. So how did, how did you get into the film stuff? When did that all start for you? Um, I always had an interest in film, you know, so growing up, you know, just to love films. I was never particularly good at anything at school, like, you know, academic. I wasn't good at math, science. Um, I was always good at sport or art. Yeah. And yeah, when it, when it came to decide, you know, do I want to go to university? I had to decide what it is I wanted to do. Mm. So I went and did a, a media degree because um, I had I, f I thought right I want to maybe be a filmmaker, but actually spending a couple of years doing this degree, it put me off filmmaking because you had to have a cinematographer, or a director, you had a whole team, a sound man. Mm. It was just it was too much. It was too overwhelming for me. So it put me off. And but then when the introduction of these DSLR cameras where you can do it all of yourself, yeah, I, I like doing everything myself. I like just doing it, just me. You know, so I got the little camera. I can do the editing by myself. Um, you know, everything's very portable. So I found a love for it again. Yeah, it's it's crazy because I didn't go to film school at all. So when I got into it, I got into it just before the DSLR thing happened. So my first camera was a Sony EX1. So it was kind of, and then people started using like the 7D. So I actually bought an EX1. Then I bought a 7D and I had like a 50 mil lens and you can get like all the crazy depth of field. So we, I, we both sort of got into it at a really similar time then, I guess, right? Yeah. I mean, I actually, I started filming and making wedding films. That's how I really taught really? myself. I mean, at university, it was all very, um, it was all paperwork, you know? It wasn't actually very hands-on. They didn't show us how to use cameras or teach us how to do editing. Huh. It was only when I left, it was all like written work. So when I left, um, that's when I uh, yeah, actually like, got into w wedding films and actually started making a living from it. So I had to teach myself the first few wedding films I made were not particularly good, but you know, you, you learn, each one got better and better. And then I started from there, that's when I started to make jujitsu films. Yeah. You know, just for fun, you know? Yeah. So there was like, were you one of the first dudes to actually film jujitsu, do you think? 
I, I definitely wasn't, well, I think I hit it at the right time, you know. Uh, there's obviously some videos on there on YouTube and a few like DVDs here and there, but it wasn't not many. Yeah. You know, so when I started pumping these uh, jujitsu short films out, documentaries, whatever you want to call them, YouTube videos, um, I was kind of the first. It was just when Facebook and YouTube yeah. were getting popular, and jujitsu was just getting popular as well. So it was a combination of this, and I really, I think I was one of the first people to just kind of make them into like little films. But mm. I was very active when I was doing it. I was putting one out every month. Yeah, right. And um, I did the first ever ADCC highlight, and that's the one that really catapulted me. You know, started. Yeah. You know, I got a lot of job jobs from that. You know, started flying around the world because of that one highlight video. Yeah, it's crazy that I, that's where I think like our parallel kind of comes into it because I've got a super similar story in that I was like crazy into motocross and then because like you're an athlete as well, like uh, you're a, a super accomplished black belt and now you're kind of circling back to doing the elite level competition stuff like you just competed at BOA, yeah. which is one of the bigger events in the world and it was kind of like, I guess my story was that I was riding motocross and I just loved it, but I knew I was never going to be like a pro motocross athlete. So I was like, well, fuck, how can I like kind of stay in this without, you know, having to get a job and then just becoming the weekend warrior dude, which is basically why I got into film. Like we never even really had a camera. We, we definitely didn't have a video camera when I was a kid, but we, I don't even think we really had like uh film cameras or anything like my parents didn't take a lot of photos so i i was like i just zero exposure to filming at all but it was just i, I guess i could see at the time that facebook and like instagram wasn't around at all mm. like i was still like i was a well-established professional filmmaker before instagram even started but i can remember going to companies and being like dude, Facebook videos are going to be the next big thing. Like you need to advertise on Facebook. You need to make these mini documentaries. You need to, uh, you know, this is going to take over. And then obviously YouTube became as, as big as it, it has. And, and now it seems like if you're not creating content or putting out stuff on YouTube, whether you're a brand, an athlete, a uh, fight promotion, a motocross team, like it doesn't matter. Like you have to, it, you just have to be making videos now. And I think it, it's just crazy we kind of we kind of just paralleled it at really the same time and and sort of did similar things and now live a similar lifestyle in a way which i just think is super cool yeah for a similar reason as well because i wanted to be i wanted to do jiu-jitsu full time uh, but through injuries I actually got my foot broke and had a dislocated arm so i couldn't train you know i had a pretty severe dislocated arm so that took a year before i could come back and train i was a blue belt then and that just kind of put me on the sidelines. I'm like, oh, I, so to stay involved in the sport, that's when I picked up a little video camera mm. and started filming seminars and training just to keep involved in the sport, to keep on learning. Because I was just fascinated with jujitsu. I just loved it right from day one. Mm. So, what, what did you, what originally got you into it? Jujitsu, I've always been interested in, I've always, like I loved uh, skateboarding, you know, any kind of sport, rugby, football. But just seeing it on TV, I tried a bunch of martial arts when I was younger, like Aikido, karate, but nothing, the ones I did, I know, I'm not sure if it was a very good uh, academy I went to, I, it didn't seem like it would work. It didn't seem legit. Yeah. Um, and then I saw UFC on TV. I had no idea what UFC was. And I asked a few people, what is this UFC? Because that looks like it's real. It's not fake. It's not WWE. And they said, no, it's like mixed martial arts. I'm like, I want to do it. I'm 22 at this time, working in a health club, just uh, on the reception. Yeah. One of the um, colleagues I was working with did Muay Thai boxing, so he took me down to my first Muay Thai session, and that's when I got hit in the face, really, for the first time. <laughs> and actually, you know, we actually did spar, and I was like, all right, this is real. And then I saw everyone in the kimonos after class. The second class was jiu-jitsu. So I was just watching them all on the ground, and, you know, yeah, I jumped in and, you know, just got hooked i preferred that i picked that over muay thai i think that there it, there's definitely like a an intelligence sort of thing that that comes into it and I, I think that yeah like there's an understanding that you have of like not only just the techniques but like what the sport is if that makes sense mm. i think some people can look at it and just not get it 
but I think that for the people that look at it and then do get it and like, oh, I really see what's going on there. They're the sort of people that can kind of like fall in and because I mean, essentially that's where I've been. I like wanted to start jujitsu forever, but because I was traveling, I was like worried that it was so complex that I'd need like a long time before I could actually like fit it into traveling. But now that I've started, I'm like, you're a fucking idiot. Like you should have just gone for three, four weeks and you would have at least had the confidence then to just like kind of go to, to any other gym and do it. But I mean, sort of hindsight's always twenty twenty. I feel like yeah. everyone in jiu-jitsu is like, oh, I wish I started it earlier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even that went through my head. But if I had started it earlier, maybe... Because I knew I started late and that yeah. pushed me. It was like, oh, I think I'm... I better like train hard if I want to do this as a profession or I better you know put the time in so would I, if I started earlier would I have you know trained as yeah. hard as I did you know yeah I guess that's like you sort of find shit at the right yeah, time I definitely you... found it the right time for me yeah yeah that's pretty cool and even those accidents that was all a blessing in disguise me dislocating my arm breaking my foot yeah it led me into the filmmaking which allowed me to travel the world and travel the best guys in the world and then I kind of went back into competing again. So it was all, all worked out in the end better. <laughs> yeah. You know? that, that's what like, so we've spent a few days hanging out. Um, you come and did some stuff at Lockie's. I trained with you here this morning. And you're definitely like a super positive, optimistic person. And it's like you can tell even when like you say, when I was like, oh, I wish I found it sooner. And your immediate response is like, no, I found it at the right time. It's like you've kind of you've got that uh that positivity thing which is i think what pushes you forward in film because there's so many challenges to to kind of living the lifestyle that we've both lived i guess like you kind of always have to be yeah. on the positive end of the spectrum because like there's a lot of curveballs that get thrown at you when you're sort of traveling and then just generally like the insecurity of like working for yourself and maintaining relationships while you're traveling and all that kind of all the bullshit that comes with it that doesn't make the YouTube ADCC highlight video. Yeah, but it's definitely, it's all or nothing with me. I mean, I'm positive with what, I'm, with what I enjoy, but if it's stuff I don't enjoy, like when I was at school, you know, I, I was just miserable and mm. doing job. And I was always, str- I always thought there was something wrong with me because every job I had growing up, I just quit or got fired. Yeah. I had zero interest and I'd just be depressed. I don't want to do this. But if I, if I like something, I'll do it 100%. But I think that's to do with my obsessive compulsive disorder. I learned how to channel that into a good yeah. thing. You know? I struggle with... Um, I struggle with that exact same thing. Like, like even my parents. So I pretty much... When I left school, I worked in a brick factory... And I had these ideas of like, I wanted to print like motocross graphics and stuff like that to, again, just to stay in motocross. Cause like the film thing just hadn't even crossed my mind at all. So I was like, I'm going to work in this brick factory, which was 12 hour shifts. I started at three out three in the afternoon and finished at three in the morning. And I, my job, the bricks came out of the, um, the kilns went onto a conveyor belt, conveyor belt come across me. And then I had to look to see if there was any cracks or chips or anything like that. And then if there was, I'd pick up the house block and then across from me was a skip. And then you'd throw it into the skip and then the forklift would come and they'd take it away. And it was like, the, I just did that because I was like, well, I fucking know for sure I, won't, I can't work for someone. So I wanted to do the most mindless, dumbest shit I could so that I could think about what it was that I actually wanted to do. And, and man, I'm the same. And even with film, like it's held me back in at times because I've if it's something that I'm not into like I just don't want to do it and it's like a blessing because the stuff that you're into you can do better than anyone at times because of the passion and the obsessive compulsive kind of nature that you spoke about yep. but then on the flip side it like fucks a lot of other shit up in your life so it's like you've really got to it, I guess it's just that, like that duality of, of life in general right yeah kind of have to take the uh the good with the bad because it's like without that bad would you be as good as what you are at the stuff that you do yeah you know what i mean um when did you start to really travel 
with it? So <clears throat> I got my, my first popular video, it was the ADCC highlight, and that's when I met Braulio Steamer, so I did a few videos of him, and they got popular right away. They were getting crazy amounts of views. Um, then I got my purple belt, and that's when I had the idea, hey, I could probably do this, like in Brazil. I could go to Brazil and film a lot of people, because it was mm. kind of limited in the UK. I'd have to wait for you know, the top athletes to come over and do seminars. So I heard about a jiu-jitsu hostel out in Rio de Janeiro. And you know, as soon as you get involved in jiu-jitsu, you want to go to Brazil. That's mm. the first place you want to go. So I contacted a guy called Dennis Ash, who owned the hostel and said, hey, Dennis, I don't know if you've seen my videos, uh, but I'd love to come out to Brazil and make a few more. So uh, if you're interested, could you give me a free stay at your hostel and free jiu-jitsu training? And in return, you know, I'll make these documentaries and put your company logo on the beginning and the end and promote your hostel. Yeah. And he jumped right on and said, yeah, when do you want to come? You know, and just gave me a free stay. He was really helpful. So when I went out there, he was actually very well connected as well. So he put me in contact with Kira Gracie, uh, Husamar Polharis, who wasn't as hated as he is right now at yeah. that time. <laughs> um, and it all just was a domino effect from there. Yeah, it's crazy that, um yeah, I suppose like once you kind of, once you kind of start and the ball gets rolling, it's just, I don't know, it seems like it, yeah. it has a way of like gathering this kind of unstoppable momentum in a way. And you just got to roll with it as well. But sometimes it did get overwhelmed and I was just in a different country all the time. I was just flying all over the place. You know? mm. So how old were you when you kind of started doing that? 26, 25, yeah, okay. how old 26, are you now? 26. How old are you now? 33. Yep, so you're like, yeah, so you're three years older than me. Yeah, yeah, so, wow, it's been for, yeah, like almost seven years of traveling. Mm. You know, it's been wild. It really has, you know. How many countries do you think you've been to now? I need to count. I actually yeah. have no idea. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting. I've, got, I've gone through several passports. Yeah, okay. You know? Yeah. And so you're in Brazil, and then did, did it kind of instantly take off to where you were sort of you could like kind of write your own ticket to wherever you wanted to go um i think i, I was just kind of i would make wherever i was like uh, so i was in brazil and then i met a guy called patrick vickers who was the promoter one of some quite high up in cage warriors and just through meeting him and uh showing him my videos when i came back to england uh, from brazil he gave me a job at cage warriors yeah. you know, he just facebook me and said Stu, do you want to we need a video guy so I always found I made contacts. Yeah. And with Cage Warriors, the job was like, they would fly me to Jordan, Dubai, you know, Ireland, um, all over Europe, you know, just to do highlight videos. Yeah. Um, so I did that for a while. And then I had the idea, I want to go out to Thailand and do this. It yeah. seems to be working. People seem to take me up on my offer. So yeah, I, I, I actually contacted Tiger Muay Thai, which is where we are now. And then they took me in right away. So yeah. <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty amazing, you know, the amount of places I've been, been able to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny that, yeah, I mean, like, it's honestly like the same story that, that I've kind of yeah. got. But were, were you, uh, did you ever have, like, doubts in yourself or anything like that that kind of stopped you asking? Or were you always a person that you just didn't give a fuck and would always ask, would always throw stuff out there and, yeah. and it seemed like shit always kind of come. Yeah, I, I just, I would just, I wasn't afraid to ask. Yeah. <clears throat> the worst you can say is no. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, I would just, I would just do it. <laughs> it's, just get it's, it done. So, it's so crazy because like how many people have come to you and said like, oh, can you give me some tips on how to get into this and how to get into that? And yeah. it's like for some people it just comes so naturally like guys like yourself and, and even for me, like to get, um, you know, like to do the work that I did for the, for the Loggy camp and then to come and um, be here with you. And like I extended my trip because I knew Mark Hunt was here and it's like, I don't know him. And you, you kind of go up, you just introduce yourself and you ask and, and you hope that, I guess the hope is that the work that you've done in the past is enough of a resume that anyone can yeah. kind of take you on. and you you're almost like using that as like this constant resume and it seems like the more you put out the easier it is for people to say yes because there's such a library of work that it kind of becomes obvious to people that you're actually like 
going to follow through on what you say. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, now I haven't done actually, I had a break at about maybe a one and a half, two year break of making videos, but because I had that much of a library of stuff I'd already done, now when I'm going, you know, like recently I filmed with Craig Jones, you know, yeah. the portfolio is already there. You know, so uh, I contacted him and he was, you know, right away he was up for doing some filming with me, Lachlan Giles. So even after a two year break, you know. Yeah, it's crazy because, um, yeah, when I got into it, a lot of people like uh, Greg, one of the guys um, who trains with me at Gala Brothers, he's a brown belt. And he's like, dude, when you get to uh, Thailand, you have to go to Tiger and you got to meet Stuart Cooper. So, I mean, there's like, you've got this like name within the industry for the filming and then the athlete, like super unique, the way that you've kind of created this like niche within the sport. Like everybody knows who you are. It's crazy. Yeah. It's weird. I don't, I didn't even realize it myself after a couple of years, you know? Mm. Um, but yeah, people actually telling me you're a brand now. I'm yeah. Like, Holy shit. This, uh, yeah. It's kind of weird to think about how and fast it happened as well but I think a lot of it is I didn't have when I did it I didn't have any ties Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have any ties back home so I wasn't afraid to travel I wasn't afraid to sleep on a gym floor you know I didn't have a girlfriend back home I didn't have a mortgage you know mm. all these things that most people have tying them down I was just free yeah free to go wherever I want I, I didn't have to be back in England I didn't have to be anywhere you know and I was I was quite you know comfortable sleeping wherever <laughs> You know? Yeah, that, that, I guess like that's where my like my nickname Gypsy came from is because basically when I did end up getting a camera, being super into motocross and racing, I kind of knew all like the up and coming dudes, and then it was like when all those up and coming dudes became the dudes, then I kind of had an in with all these people. Now all these companies wanted were endorsing them, and they're on all the biggest teams, and and I had access to all these people and you mix that with exactly what you said like i didn't have any ties man like i could do whatever i want like i i had a fucking toyota high ace and i lived in that son of a bitch for like three years and i just drove around australia to every big race i could where every big name dude was and then in between all that shit i would just sleep on their couch or if i had nowhere to sleep i'd sleep in the bed in my van like i had a a proper mattress that was just like laid on the floor of my high ace and like that was that was my life and to some people some people aren't whether it's out of like uh ego or whether it's out of um fear they they're not down to do those those hard yards because i think that like people don't get that when you start a business you know they say like something percent 90 percent of businesses fail in the first year or whatever it's because it's so fucking hard. And as much as you want the freedom to travel all around the world and to not have a boss and not and do all the, the things that you get to do now, people want that less than they want to be comfortable a lot of times. Yeah. And it's like guys like yourself, and, and I, I mean, I know what you've been through without even you telling me your story. Like just the, the facts I do know, I fucking, I know what you've, what you've had to go through because it's, oh, yeah. it's shit I've had to do and I was never too like like never too proud to sleep on someone's couch I was never too proud to be broke as fuck and just getting to the next round I never cared I never cared because all I wanted was that freedom and that freedom to be able to do what I want to do and almost like I guess like the um, like the promise of what it could be in the future is enough to just have you go, fuck it. I don't need money. I don't need a house. I don't need any of this bullshit because it's like that, that little light at the end of the tunnel is like this place that you've always dreamed of being. And that's with no one being able to tell you what to do, being able to do what you want to do. But I just think everyone kind of wants that, that light at the end of the tunnel, but in those first few years, the shit that you have to go through, it's like fucking army boot camp, but for years. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you never know when the next paycheck is coming as well. Mm. You know, it's kind of scary sometimes. And, <clears throat> it, you know, when, when we're going through this, we post all these pictures, like, 
and there's always different countries me and all these famous people but people like you said we don't they don't see what happens you know leading up to that you know the amount of traveling mm. that goes into it you know um yeah for years and years of traveling you know as i was telling you my, my health it really took a yeah. an impact on my health which is why i had to step away for a while yeah, it's uh, crazy the that job you got so run down that you had to almost ki- stop. almost kill me <laughs> it's almost crazy me. well even like i was thinking on the way here so it's like a fucking bazillion degrees right now in thailand and my hotel is probably a kilometer down the road i had 40 kilo bag a backpack that's probably another 20 kilos and then my camera and i had to fucking trudge that shit down here because i don't have a car here so i had to walk for like a kilometer with all my equipment to do the podcast it's like that shit sucks it fucking sucks and i'm not instagramming that because my hands are full i got no fucking wi-fi you know like it, you're right it's like the highlight reel goes on instagram but it's like come and carry this fucking shit around thailand yeah. for weeks and then have salt getting in, you know, like sweat getting in all your gear, which you paid thousands of dollars for and shit getting broken by the airlines. Like it's just, and then not to mention like the fatigue that you feel. Like, oh my God, it's horrible. You know, and we were talking, you were saying the other day, is this a common thing? Um, like chronic fatigue syndrome, yeah. which is something I actually developed. And my uh, my housemate is just, <laughs> who's also a filmmaker. Does he fly a lot? He travels all the time. He's just been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm. And he had the same symptoms I had. Yeah, I'm for sure. Like, I, I don't think I ever went and got it, it diagnosed. But when I was living in the States, I like 100% had chronic fatigue. Like there were days I just couldn't get out of fucking bed. Yeah. And I'd walk from the bed to the couch and that was it. Like my brain wasn't working, my body wasn't working, I wasn't hungry, I wasn't, I was just tired. Everything yeah. about just me was just tired. Can't concentrate, right? No, there's, it's no, like, there's um, nothing there. Imagine, you know, for people that don't understand, you know what it's like to be jet lagged yeah. after a 17 hour flight. But imagine doing that every week, mm. what that's gonna do to your body. Cause being up there, miles in the sky is not, na- is not natural. So I don't know what it is that's happening to your body up there but it can really when you travel a lot it messes your body up it, it's it's pretty pretty brutal yeah there's a thing i wish i knew exactly what it was called but i found out about this through my friend who's actually a commercial pilot um and he was telling me that there's some it's some form of like altitude sickness that you get and it's responsible for like basically giving you chronic fatigue but it's through it's with people that just spend like a lot of time uh, flying and it's just years and years of, of that altitude and it just fucks you up and you get like crazy chronic fatigue yeah it's a gnarly spot to be in yeah it's uh, I wish that on nobody no know? even Sunday like because with I did this camp and then so I had to film the camp but I also was trying to train in the camp and it was like full on training and I mean even like the rolling with you like I was putting everything into every role every day I think we pro- I probably trained for maybe four and a half hours a day for the full eight days that I was at that camp. And then Sunday, when we, we kind of went out, like none of us could even go out. We were all just like, fuck yeah, we're going to hit Padang, uh, Patong Beach, we're going to party. And uh, we didn't even get there. Like I was fucking exhausted, man. And then Sunday I woke up and we all got breakfast and I was basically falling asleep at breakfast because I don't know if you get it, but it's like I've done trips where like we shot this uh, film for Red Bull and it was at Lake Tahoe. And I think it, it's at like 12 or 14,000 feet. Oh, no, not that high. It's about 8,000, 8 to 10,000 feet uh, elevation. And so I think in the four days we walked on foot with camera gear 22 miles at that elevation. And it was like... The gnarl- one of the gnarliest film jobs I've ever done, but I could push through until it's over. And once it's over, I just fucking melt. Like I just fully collapse. And it's like there's a thing in your head because you know you have to get it done that you like won't let yourself really feel the effects of being tired until it's over. And it's been a while since I've had that because I've been doing the podcast and it's not like crazy physically demanding. Mm. But then this week for filming and then training and like every time I was... Uh, finished training, I'd race back to the hotel, I'd dump the footage, I'd charge my batteries while everyone else at the camp's chilling 
and you know kind of doing their thing and even on the tours i was still filming and then bang it's five o'clock you got to be back at the gym and then you're there till seven seven thirty same thing back to the hotel do your dinner go back charge your batteries but yeah sunday dude i, I was basically asleep at breakfast and then when i got back from breakfast i just i was supposed to check out and i was like yeah it's not fucking happening i mean yeah. and I, I just i had to sleep i mean this is why i took a two-year break i just could not travel anymore I mean, I was always good at jiu-jitsu and I was always quite a heavy, strong guy, but through constant traveling, my weights just declined. I ended up being 70 kilograms and I was always around 88, I could 90. not imagine you at yeah, 70 I'm 90 kilograms. kilograms right now, a healthy 90 kilograms. Could you imagine me at 70? So this, I went down to 70 when I was a brown belt and I just remember traveling around and people, I was getting smashed by blue belts and like people were like, oh, this guy was meant to be like, okay, I thought he was a brown belt. But people didn't realize how, what I was going through, you know? Uh, which, so when I took a two year break, that's when I took the time to, you know, put the weight back on, get my health back. So. You get back to a fucking straight killer. Yeah, so like, like, since I've stopped, I've, my jiu jitsu's got so much better again, you know? But um, as I was telling you, uh, when you do a lot of traveling, I was starting to suffer with insomnia. Yeah, so a lot of so the, let, yeah, let's talk about that because I did. We like touched on it, but I didn't fully. Yeah, we didn't fully. Get I was into always it. tired. Yeah, I couldn't sleep. Yeah. So I made the mistake because you could just fucking you buy these things over the counter here. Dude, I started now, taking. I'm actually uh, going to hit the canvas before I go home. Yeah, that's that's okay. But uh, I actually started taking um, diazepam and Xanax just to sleep, mm. and that. I didn't, there was ignorance on my part. I just kind of, I didn't realize how bad these things are for you. You're only supposed to take them like every now and again. Yeah. But I was taking them for flights. And then when I'd arrive, if I'm jet lagged, I would take them again. But this became a, because I was flying all the time, this became a bad habit. Yeah. Before I know it, I'm a year in and I'm taking probably like two diazepams a day. I'm not knowing how addictive these things are for you. So, so years did, and years did, in. Were you like telling people that you're on this stuff? No, no, I just take it. Because you buy so, them really cheap here. Yeah, you know? and so you didn't have anyone that was going like, hey, dude, these are gnarly. Like, you gotta, you got to be careful with them. You just no, thought no. it was like consequence-free in a way. I mean, I think about a year, six months to a year in, once I, because I started getting a bad memory. I started becoming quite slow you know <laughs> uh, quite a slow thinker and people are even commenting like are you okay you know you seem a bit drowsy all the time mm. and then i did my research on the internet and i realized oh shit i've been taking these things a lot and i actually flew to melbourne and i didn't take any with me because i knew they were illegal then they're pretty strict getting into melbourne so i didn't take any in, what in was my, illegal uh, the diazepam uh, diazepams unless you have a prescription but you just buy it buy them over the counter here mm. um so I arrived in Melbourne and I've been taking like one or two of these pills every day for a couple of years now. And it's the first time I didn't wow. have any. So I'm in Melbourne and then my body starts going into withdrawal effects. And um, it's like, like a lightning flash headaches. It really? Was, uh, yeah, like extreme anxiety. And right away, I kind of knew what it was. I Googled, you know, withdrawals from diazepam and it come up every symptom that I had. Wow. So I had to fly back to Thailand early, go to the pharmacy as soon as I took one. I was fine and that's when i realized i had a problem I was like, oh sh like what because that's I'm, drug addiction it's addiction it's yeah. addiction and it's funny because this is a problem with school i mean when you're at school they teach you about all the hard drugs like don't don't take crack heroin and we all you know those kind of drugs but the, some of the most dangerous addictive drugs on the planet are the ones that they're they buying a pharmacy yeah. the doctor will give you a prescription and not actually tell you how addictive these things are for you and because I buy it in a pharmacy and it's in a little silver Tiny pack. little pill. You kind of just think, oh, it's, it's not that bad, you know? It's not like I'm buying it off a street corner or some drug dealer, you know? Um, but I, I, then I went back to UK because I realized I could have to stop taking these. Mm. But you can't just stop taking them, you know? It's because um, yeah, your body will go into seizures, which is exactly what happened. So I went back to UK and I told my mom and dad, I say, hey, look, um, I need to, I've been taking these kind of sleeping pills. I need to stop taking them, but I need to taper off. And actually I didn't bring any back into UK because they're illegal there. So we actually went to a doctor and I told him the truth. You know, I've been taking one of these every day for a few years. I don't have any, but I want to taper off. The doctor wouldn't help me oh, because, really? because I self medicated. So I said, but I can, and then I started going into withdrawal. I went back the next day to speak to him again. I said, look, you're going to have, you're going to have to help me. He would not help me. 
and then sure enough so people are just looking at you like you're a fucking junkie basically yeah yeah just like you know like it was my own fault but i don't think the doctors were really clue i'm not sure if they knew what you know like how bad how you, bad yeah. the withdrawals are and then I, I started to feel like I started getting little muscle twitches all over my body. Mm. Uh, I remember my mom and dad going out for a walk in the morning. They came back and I, they just found me unconscious on the floor. I'd actually had the seizure. Fuck. I'd fell face down, split my orbital bone open. And luckily they got back just in time where my mom's a former nurse. She rolled me into the recovery position. And it all, I don't remember any of this. And then the, I just remember the paramedics waking me up going, Stuart, do you know where you are? What, you know what day it is, what year it is? And um, yeah, so I'd, once, I, luckily I came around from that, they took me into the hospital and it took me a couple of weeks to kind of get my memory back. And my, I was wow. really fucked up. So then I went there, we actually found a doctor who helped me, it was illegal for him to help me. He was doing it under the table, you know, like he wasn't allowed to have a record of it. So if you go to the doctor and you're an alcoholic, they will give you diazepam for, to help you come off. If you are, if I had gone to him and said, oh, I'm flying tomorrow, can I have some diazepam? Sure. But if you go to the doctor and tell him, I've been taking diazepam and now I've run out and I've self-medicated and I'm going through withdrawals, they won't help you. It's kind of messed up system in the UK. It's crazy so, that I guess like Western culture just generally has a system of punishment as opposed to understanding. And then it's very quick to put you in a box of like, oh, you're a drug addict yeah. and you should be punished. But there's, there's no, like everything has gray area, man. And I think that there needs to be a lot more understanding, understanding of why yeah. people, because like I had this conversation the other day, I've got some people that I know that have drug problems in their life and I've had some uh, really bad experiences with those people right and for a really long time i was like i hated the drug but i didn't hate the person yeah and and i, I it was like this weird uh relationship that i kind of created with like drugs in inverted commas and it's like well it's not it, like say you've got diazepam in the silver packet and it's just sitting there then it's, that's not going to hurt anyone. And the thing that kind of annoys me about this is that the same could be said for guns, and I'm not a big proponent of, I'm not a big fan of guns. Mm. But without someone squeezing the trigger, then it, it is just an object. And I think that the responsibility needs to then fall back on the person, which in this instance would be yourself. And then if you then look at you, it's like, why, what led you to do this? And then there's ignorance there on your behalf. There's a just, lot, there's all just ignorance. Just innocent, plain innocent yeah. ignorance. But once it's too late, it's too late. I was, yeah. I was too deep in when I realized, and I realized, but everything was going so well in my life. Like we said, it was a domino effect. I was getting jobs here, jobs here, jobs here. And I'm thinking, well, I can't quit now. I can't go in, because I knew mm. I was going to go for withdrawals. Because everything's going so well. If I quit now, I won't get this job or I won't get yeah. to go and film this guy, or this guy. So I basically sacrificed my health. To you know, keep I working. carried on taking them for once I knew I had a problem, I carried on. It was probably another year or so. But I just carried on taking them because it wasn't the right time to come off. Yeah. Uh, but when it was, I actually, it was 10 months, 10 months to, to detox. From, and I was only taking 20 milligrams, so two 10 milligram And so you a day. didn't have to up the dose? No. Oh, no, okay. no. Yeah, luckily that, that happens. I've read some horror stories on the internet. Luckily, really? my situation wasn't bad. I, I've read stories that people are on the internet, you know, there's these little forums, people taking like 20 of them a day. Fuck. And I think if you're taking 20 a day, ooh, that's you're gonna done. Be, yeah, you're going to die. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to go well for you. But luckily, I didn't go too far. Mm. Down the line. But it still took me 10 months. And those withdrawals coming off diazepam, they're horrific. Really? Horrific. So what kind of symptoms did you have? Um, I couldn't sleep at all. Like really? maybe I was lucky if I got one or two hours a night for probably six months. And so what diazepam does, it's like an anti-anxiety. It puts you to sleep. And so it's the opposite. So when you come off these things, yeah. you have extreme anxiety and paranoia and you just can't sleep you can't relax you're irritable all the time you just an extreme depression 
So look, I went into depression, but I knew what it was because I'm not really, I don't get depressed. No, I'm quite a positive you're happy, person. Positive I'm back dude. to myself now, but I went through very bad like depre- symptoms of depression. But luckily I knew what it was and I knew this wasn't going to last. Yeah. You know, I kept telling myself like, this is going to be over. You're going to get through it. You're going to get through it. But Fuck man, you, the like, cravings, it's pretty though, impressive though that you could keep that mindset because yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with um, people that uh, are having problems which are, valid problems like it's a there's a reason they should be feeling the way they are and that message of like it's gonna get better it's gonna get better it's so fucking hard for someone to see when they are just got that fucking cloud over a man and like you just it's it's, hard you have to have so much understanding and compassion for somebody that's going through that because a lot of times they can't do what you did and say it's going to be okay it's going to be okay because fuck man that's a heavy mm. it's a heavy thing to wear every single day yeah i mean yeah so I, even after the 10 months after i was fully off everything they, i can't describe the cravings to you like you just want to take one and he, i was clean i was finally off him for a couple months but i still just all i could think about was like just taking one because really? cause, cause, because i still had the symptoms i still this is i had the like the fatigue i couldn't concentrate i was still depressed and I got a job offer out in Singapore, and I'm like, I took it, but I knew I couldn't leave the country. And so yeah. if I, if I, all I was telling Singapore myself, is like crazy for drugs. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, exactly. They, they are fucking, that's a place you don't want to be. Right. So I knew if I took, if I went out to Singapore now, all I'm thinking is I'll probably end up in a pharmacy and buy some more, you know, just tell myself, yeah. just go and buy 10, just to get you through the first week. That's how addiction works. But mm. I knew what it was. So luckily for me, a blessing in disguise, my appendix just went, went gangrenous. So I couldn't fly out to Singapore. So it was the best thing ever. At the time, I'm like, why is this happening to me? I'm going from, through withdrawals, now my appendix go. But that made me hell back, that made me stay back and I had time to think, really think, right, right, you're gonna, you still have a problem here. Yeah. You're gonna, you cannot leave you know, home and go back and out into the world without dealing this problem because you still have strong cravings. You're not, you're not right, you're not yourself. So what was it about, what was the cravings? Do you think it was still the actual physical cravings for the drug or yeah. was it mentally that it had become like a crutch for you to lean on? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, because those diazepams, they literally change your brain chemistry. They raise the serotonin levels in your brain, as in, the st- I, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so when you suddenly stop taking them, your brain isn't releasing serotonin or dopamine, these like mm. happy chemicals, the reward chemicals. So even though it's training, going for walks, trying to do everything right, um, so I even my through jiu jitsu and training, like you just still were pretty it helped. flat. It helped, but I was flat. You know, I did everything right during those ten months. I was out walking twice a day, listening to positive music, watching positive films. Um, so you took it like really seriously. Oh, I took it because I knew like I wouldn't have my life back. Uh, yeah. Once you look into the, the you know, uh, how how bad these drugs are, like Xanax and diazepam, it's a lot of people don't come back from it because the withdrawals are so. Uh, severe have you seen like uh any of the like new rapper shit that comes out and they're all like singing about zans there's like a no. rapper called lil zan the the whole xanax thing's back hard dude oh no yeah and uh they're the worst I, I mean that and opiates are the worst i think yeah well this kid um his name is lil pump and like dead set dude like his music is on another fucking level like he was yeah. doing some really 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 amazing shit 20s 20, 21 22 and overdosed on a xanax that had fentanyl in it oh no so now yeah. people are like fentanyl what prince died of prince overdosed on yeah fentanyl, and I same think. with fucking um whitney houston philip seymour hoffman and uh, so many people uh, tom petty yeah Tom Petty, they said, was, was, Xanax as, uh, was Xanax as well. Yeah, it's usually a combination. It's usually a combination of alcohol, benzos, yeah. um, and opiates. Just downers, rock, man. Like, yeah, downers. You yeah. can't, you can't mix Throw downers. some Adderall in there, some Vicodin. A lot of people that have these kind of crazy jobs, they fall into these. It seems to be the drugs of choice, mm. you know, just because of the travel and the hours involved in it. Like I said, so I knew that my, it was my brain, my rule, I knew I was still having these symptoms because my brain chemistry was all messed up. Mm. So the doctor said, it's probably going to be a few years before you feel normal again, before you can concentrate. And I couldn't edit, I couldn't do video, I couldn't, my jujitsu was shit, I couldn't think. 
Mm. So that's when I came across ayahuasca. I'd heard about it before through podcasts like Joe Rogan podcast. Um, and it always fascinated me. I was like, this sounds interesting. But then I read, I don't know how I came across it, but I read online that ayahuasca is a, known as a cure, an actual mm. cure for depression, anxiety, addiction. So I thought I need, I can't, like I said, I can't go back out into the world. Maybe, maybe this could help. Maybe I could, I don't know, it's worth a try because nothing else is working. The doctor hasn't suggested anything else. So I told my mom and dad I was going to London for a weekend filming because mm. I knew they wouldn't, you know, understand so, what yeah. I was about How to do. How old are you when this was happening, by the way? Oh, this is like two and a half years, two years ago. It's not so long this ago. Is not that this is year, very right? recent. Fuck, that's it. Yeah. Heavy. And I'm like 70 kilograms at this time. I'm still not, I'm still not myself. So luckily, and, and I, you are now strong as absolute fuck as I well, found out over the last few days. I mean, once you get through that, I mean, once I got healthy again, I've just been tra- working hard because life is so good right now. That's crazy. And I got my life back, but um, I found an ayahuasca place in Denmark. So I told my mum and dad I'm going to London because I knew they wouldn't understand. And I flew to Denmark for the weekend. I got a flight to, to Copenhagen. Met up with a bunch of people and a shaman who we then drove three, four hours to a ferry point where we got a ferry over to an island called Fimu. Uh, so we got a two hour boat ride over to Fimu and there's only a hundred people that live on this island. And we participated in this ayahuasca ceremony, two nights drinking ayahuasca. So I did the diet. I did this last minute, so I was only able to diet for a week. So what are you supposed to do on the diet? Um, no caffeine, no coffee, no stimulants, no meat. Pretty okay, much. I'm never doing oh, it. Oh, dude, I just, <laughs> it's hard. Trick quitting coffee is the hardest thing. Yeah, but, I, know, uh, I just ate brown rice and broccoli for a week. Um, so when I went there, the first night drinking it, it was a pretty amazing experience. Um, I had a lot of visuals, you know. And, um, it wasn't overwhelming. It was, it was nice. I think it was like a tester. But then the second night, I had two and a half glasses. I went deep. Yeah, right. And that's, that, it's very hard. You can't put into words, you know, what actually happens. That's crazy. Um, but I remember the day after, two nights drinking ayahuasca, I remember waking up in the morning and feeling, feeling myself. I felt happy. I felt like how I used to feel. I felt full of energy. I like actually went for a run on FEMA. I've just been dragging my feet for like a while, you know, for months. And I went for a run. I'm, I was just so what and I couldn't believe it. We sat around in a circle and you talk about your experiences with the medicine, what you know, what um, what you saw, what visuals you had. And I remember flying back from FEMA. We got back into Manchester. Went back home. My mum and dad saw they saw how I was, and they're like, "What, what happened to you what this weekend?" What did you do? They said, "Yeah, what did you do?" And went. Oh, I met a girl the weekend. That's all I could think of. I'm not going to tell them I was just drinking ayahuasca in Denmark. That's some pussy. <laughs> yeah, so they're like, oh, wow, you seem really happy. And I'm like, yeah, I feel great. And then from that point, the first thing I did was sign up to a jiu-jitsu tournament. And then st- I signed up to a gym. I started lifting weights again, started getting back into jiu-jitsu again. My weight piled on quick. You know, muscle memory is a real thing because I was always mm. quite heavy before. And then, yeah, um, I went out to, to Singapore. I took the job offer and then... I got my life back. But once you get through something like that, it, it was a rough, it, one hell of a rough period. But once you get through something like that, it can only make you stronger. mentally stronger. And it, it definitely made me grow up. It made me think I had a, a long time to think about life, you know. And uh, Because you're so in your head through that depression. Yeah, and I had a long time to, you know, it's amazing what these, these psychedelics can do. I've really like, researched a lot of it right now, but it didn't just help me with my, um, you know, the symptoms that I had. Uh, certain fallouts that I'd had over the years. You know, through life, we, we meet people, we, have, we fall out with friends, we fall out with family, yeah. you know. And then for some reason, it, I, I remember I was, for certain people, I was carrying a lot of hate. Like, if I ever see that guy again, I'm going to, you know, going to knock him out, or, you know, just stupid, stupid yeah. stuff. After doing this ayahuasca, it made me realize, well, why am I holding on to all this hate for these certain people? You know, and I was able to let that go. I actually contacted all my, the people I'd had fallouts with, all my ex-girlfriends who I'd fallouts with, and just apologized. I said, I'm so sorry, you know. It's, it, was, it was quite, quite, quite a big thing for me to do that, you know, to mm. just let go of this. There's a saying, uh, holding on to hate is like letting someone live rent free in your mind. Yeah, Something like yeah, that. yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, there was a, I got a lot of, 
a lot of benefits from uh, doing the ayahuasca. Yeah, it's something that <laughs> scooch forward a bit here. Um, it's something that I haven't done, but it's definitely a, something that I'm gonna do. Um, but what was your experience with psychedelics before that? Like, had you ever done any psychedelics? Um, I tried mushrooms when I was like 21. And I even think that had an effect on me that I didn't realize. Because I was going down the whole nine to five route. Went to university. I'm about to get a job in London. You know, I, sorry, I did get a job in London. Sit at a desk eight till six every day in front of a computer. I went out to uh, Den uh, sorry Amsterdam and I did mushrooms for the first time and that made me realize like whoa what what what, what the are, fuck am I doing what the fuck am I London? doing like do jujitsu just do jujitsu full time yeah I remember having the experience and that's exactly what I went back to London I quit my job and just started doing jujitsu full time and that led me down the filmmaking path and yeah just went from there but I don't think at the time I realized what how much of an effect that uh, those psilocybin mushrooms had on me because it uh, the I'm not sure how they work. There's a lot of science, a lot of research going into them right well, now. Basic, basically, the way that I understand it is that the psilocybin molecule is basically the same as... Oh, it binds to your serotonin receptors in the same way that serotonin does, but it doesn't deplete you like the way that uh, ecstasy and all of those kind of... Like, they actually flood your brain full yes. of it, and it's... Uh, like an artificial serotonin and it's so much that then your body that's why you have like those yeah. big come downs on it but i'm pretty sure there's just something crazy that's actually in the sylvan molecule that just slides yeah. straight into your brain and and it doesn't kind of give you a lot of those those negative effects but yeah. how deep did you go on that mushroom was it just you kind of like got uh, it wasn't it wasn't it? Like too wasn't, deep it yeah. just um, it can't it was very it was the first time in my life I'd had like a, an altered state of consciousness, you know, oh, like seeing okay. things differently for yeah. the first time. Like, I, never, I know, I think uh, just growing up, it's, it's hard to put into words, but all of a sudden I was like, wow, like I'm, a, I'm like a human. I'm in this meat suit, you know, yeah. like I'm just, this whole life is like a little video game. Like, yeah. d find, it, find out what it is you want to do. And what is it you really enjoy and just do that you only live once it kind of gave me a, a different way of like thinking. a perspective yeah it gave me a perspective that's especially what especially the ayahuasca this time you mm. know it just gave me a whole new perspective on life well you see like for the people like obviously a lot of people will watch the podcast but more people listen to it on itunes so you're a big dude you're the de you're the definition of like a, a heavyweight fighter basically tattoos big fucking dude imposing guy but when you talk and hang out with you it's the opposite you're the opposite of what you look like which i think is why you're such an interesting character and even when you like we've rolled together a couple of times now and there's there's no aggression there's no like all of the things that I would expect from a guy that looks like you has the skill set you have. Like you're one of the best jujitsu athletes in the world at the moment, I and it's like, <laughs> well, you de you're competing at the at the highest level yeah. as a black belt, and there's not there's not a huge population of people that can say that they do that. So for the skills that you have and the physical abilities that you have, there's it would be forgivable almost to have an ego that would go along with that. But it just doesn't fucking exist, man. Like, it's not there. And it's super interesting to me that, like, when you say, oh, I was this guy before that held on to hate, and I could see that, man. I could see that being you. That's what you mm. look like. You look like the guy that would hold on to yeah. hate and have falling out to oh, people and then fucking never talk to I was very again. different, very different. But, yeah, like, now you, you come across as the the person that has had like that spiritual kind of enlightenment that you do get from doing those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, think having I think it's a good thing to have this adversity in life. You know, it's weird to say, but having going through that experience that I went, the withdrawals, I wouldn't, I, again, I wish that on nobody, but I'm glad that happened. Mm. I'm very glad, I'm very thankful for it. Even though it was brutal at the time, it was more brutal for my family. They didn't, they, I wasn't sure, I don't think they thought I was going to, they it, didn't yeah. know if I was going to make it. Did you think about suicide and stuff? Or you, no, you I never that? actually had any of those thoughts because this is something, this, these are some of the symptoms when people are coming off these uh, yeah. benzodiazepams, uh, suicidal thoughts are very, yeah. you know, a lot of people have these. But I think for me, I had a good life, before this happened, I had a great life. I was yeah. traveling the world. 
and then I fucked up. So, but I knew, okay, if I get through this, I had a good life before, so I know I can have I can that get back. It back. Whereas other people might struggle getting off drugs because, you know, they live in the back streets of fucking, you know, New York, Edinburgh. They've never really had, you know, much. Well, that's the thing. That and I, then they find drugs and it makes them feel better. Mm. And then they realize they have a problem and they're saying, oh, you're going to have you're going to have to come off these things. But why? Life is shit. Yeah. So there's no really reason to get off. And whereas me, it was a lot easier because I, I had a good life before and I wanted to I wanted it back. You know? There's a there's a TED talk. I'm not sure if you've watched it, but if you haven't, I'll send it to you. And I mean, fuck anyone should listen to it. It's, it's crazy. There's a there's a guy that specializes in addiction and uh he did this talk and he said that before people did studies and tests on addiction with like rats and things like that, like they'd give rats cocaine and fucking that all overdose and die basically on cocaine. They're like, oh, this is the most addictive substance that you can give anybody because 100% of the rats that we gave cocaine to overdosed on cocaine and died. And then this guy was just like, this seems like kind of crazy that there's no outliers. There's no, like, it's just a hundred percent. If you do Coke, you're fucking dead. And like, I don't know if you fucking done Coke, but I've done Coke and I'm yeah. not dead. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, is it, is it true that you, that a hundred percent of people that do Coke die? Because that's what these studies are start, starting to say, no, I don't think that's you true. know, so they're saying it's so, <laughs> it's so addictive. It's definitely very addictive. Um, but that's some, luckily fortunately, man, that was something I never had a problem with. Well, I think though, so this study, basically what they were studying is they were studying these rats that lived in a cage that had nothing in it just cocaine in their water so then it's like well if i'm if if you like we're in a fucking a conference room right now if all i had in this room i couldn't do anything else there was no fucking walls and there was some cocaine in some water i'm probably getting fucked up and dying if that was like that was your life that was it that's all you've ever known it's all you ever will know why would you not do it exactly yeah because you're like well life is fucking shit I yeah. might as well feel good and then die as opposed to feel shit for a way longer time and then die. Yeah. So then this, this researcher took these rats and then he put them in, he put one rat, like one set of rats in a cage with nothing else, the same controlled study that they've always done. And then he put these other rats in these like massive fucking cages with bitches to root and like all this fucking shit, all this activity going on, all these toys, constant enrichment, and then water and then cocaine water. And none of those rats died. Hmm. And it's like, okay, so is it the rat? Is it the drug or is it the cage? And I think that what you see, it's exactly what you said. It's like these people that have these drug addictions to these nasty drugs is they're the cheapest drugs and they live in completely fucking shit environments. And it's like, sure, there are people that get out. There are people that can say no. But not everyone is built with that mental fortitude to kind of like say no and... um, Fuck this thing. um, Say no and then push through. Not everyone has that gear. And I think that it's not a fair chance for the people that don't have that gear because there's probably... Well, there is people that get addictions and... uh, different things that do come from good lives and then they do overdose and they do die that there is people that still have all of that and still succumb to it so it's like should we judge these people's people that have these shit lives they've only grow up in this place one percent of people get out to a better life and Mm -hmm. it's like then again it's like that that punishment culture like punishing these people labeling them as these drug addicts and it's like fuck man put yourself in their Mm. shoes well what would you do if you couldn't get out like it's hard it's so hard even for like even for me right i've had a fucking great life i've had a great career i've i've I've, i'm one of those people that's like oh you live in the dream i am that person a hundred percent but there's been times for me where it's been so fucking hard that I want to quit and I'm over it and I don't want to do it anymore. So it's like, and I'm a person that's been given all these opportunities and given all this stuff and I still have those feelings of like, fuck this. So it's like, imagine the person that's never got an opportunity, that's never been given the support, that doesn't come from a place that even offers support. It's not a a place where you'd want to be. I just, I, I can't judge people now when I see people that have these fucked up lives. And again, it's like, it's, it's the person that, that, that's had to make a choice. And mm. 
sometimes it's the fucking it's the move <laughs> like yeah you know and you, you just have to feel sorry for the situation that they were that they either put themselves in or were put in it's just the cards they were dealt yeah. right yeah you know? and and again people get people get dealt shitty cards all the time and don't go down that road mm. but a lot of people do and it's it's always the rundown areas the poor areas where there's no jobs so mm. what else are they gonna do you know yeah. they have nothing to do so um it's actually a guy called dr carl hart he's been on joe mm. rogan mm. podcast the london real podcast and listening to him was fascinating because during my withdrawals i was listening to a lot of things he was saying he was talking exactly about this mm -hmm. you know and how he wants to treat you know he was brought up in that society of everyone doing drugs and he wondered why and, and it's the drugs are not to blame yeah it's the surroundings and i know? think it's so hypocritical to blame the drugs that are illegal to take yeah but then like you said you give you, someone turns to alcohol and then you're like oh you need to get into a 12 step program and it's mm. like we're going to help you get through this because alcohol is legal to buy yeah it can still fucking kill you the same as all this other shit yeah. it's just le there's no stigma but then you talk about heroin or you talk about crack mm. you don't get that same level of support you get a lot of judgment and you're yeah. in a you're in a different place or self-medicating mm. on prescription drugs you, it's it's a it's a real fine line of judgment that people make quite easily it's changing towards psychedelics now right that stigma mm. i think people are starting to realize that these things can actually help i mean it's crazy that you can go to the doctor and get some benzodiazepam some opiates that so many people die every day of yet it's illegal to have to go and have a, a mushroom that grows in a mushroom. it's illegal they're gonna Dude. it's a class a drug a class a drug means it's got no medicinal value and it's addictive. Mm. How the fuck is mushrooms and ayahuasca a class A drug? Something that actually helped me get off. It mm. cured addiction. It's not addictive. Mm. It's hard not to. Once you, you don't want to do mushrooms all the time. You can't no, do mushrooms no. every day. And ayahuasca, that's a brutal experience. You are fro you're purging. You're I wanted. Uh, yeah, we'll get into you're that. You're shitting a bit yourself. Later. <laughs> it's uh, it's a so why would you want to? Do you, there's no way you could do that every day physically. You, you would never do that every day. Dude, it's crazy. I picked some mushrooms the other day. I was like out filming and there's like a big paddock and we just had some rain. It's, it's a cattle property. So I just found a bunch of mushrooms growing and I was like, fuck, that's yeah. sick. So I picked these mushrooms. And while I was picking the mushrooms, I was like, this is fucking crazy that if I get caught driving home with these mushrooms, I'll get in trouble. Yeah. This shit growed like yeah. a, this grew out of the ground like a fucking dandelion. And there's... There's mushrooms that grow out of the ground that if I eat, I'll die or get sick, right? I can eat these mushrooms and I could maybe get sick in terms of like throwing up from the taste or whatever, but I'm not, I can't get sick. I can't die from these, these mushrooms, mm. but the, the one that I can't die from is illegal, but the one that I could eat and die, I can, I can pick that out of the ground and I can eat it mm. and no one's going to stop me. They're just going to say oh, you're a fucking idiot. You shouldn't eat and that. It's poisonous. Yeah. But one falls under this blanket from the mm. government and one, they're just like, yeah, whatever, mm. do what you want. Like here in Thailand, I, I like to take, when I have an injury now, I do not t touch any prescription drugs, but I take a Kratom. Kratom is a oh, leaf. Oh, really? It's a leaf. You, can that you get that here? You, if you know the right people. <laughs> Dude, hook me up. Uh, I want to try that yeah, shit. Yeah, I can, I can hook you up. We can have I want to try that, yeah. It's, a, it's, great. it's an amazing plant, and it eases people's opiate withdrawals. Yeah. And it's like a small dose is like a cup of coffee. Higher dose is more like a sedative. But the, the LD50 is a ridiculous amount. Yeah, LD, yeah. Lethal dose. Lethal yeah. dose. Um, so you can't... It's almost impossible to overdose on. And if you have an injury, like you've just had surgery, you can take Kratom to help. It's an, a bit of an anti-inflammatory, but it takes the pain away. It affects the same receptors in the brain as, say, Tramadol, Vicodin, Percocet, Fentanyl. No shit. Yeah, it's illegal. It's highly illegal. It blows because, me away. do you know why? It cuts into the opiate profits. Yeah. That's why they banned it here like 40 years ago in Thailand, because it was cutting into the opiate profits. So it's illegal for you to go and pick a leaf off the tree and eat it. 
you know, for something that makes you for something that makes you feel better. Yeah. You know, but it's fine. You've already go and take these uh, prescription painkillers. That's okay. That as long you as you're will giving kill money, you. That will LD50 kill you. is low as fuck. Yeah. Be low careful. As fuck. Yeah. Be careful. And don't have any alcohol because then yeah. you'll never wake up. Like, it's fucking crazy. And they do, I don't know what it is about these prescription drug, drugs. They do something to your brain, you know, they affect your overall health. But something like Kratom, it's an, it's it's an uh, additive. Um, it helps yeah. you a lot. Yeah, it doesn't slow your thinking down or your cognitive function. It doesn't make you moody, have your mood swings. It's, it doesn't have anything like that. If you take too much, you're probably going to feel a little bit sick. Yeah, you're, you're going to have diarrhea. Weird, yeah. You know, one thing I must point out about Kratom, though, because a lot of people are trying to promote it at the moment and make it legal all over the world mm. again, which is great because I think it should be. But it's definitely addictive. Yeah. There's withdrawals from Kratom. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, like uh, a lot of people... Uh, yeah, they, they pretend that it's not addictive, but it is. But the withdrawals, you know, I suppose are not too bad compared to other drugs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, a big one that's going around. And then what's the other one that people are using at the moment to get off opiates? Um, shit. Um, yes, Iboga. Iboga. Yeah. Yeah, so which is... Fit it's a root, t- 24 right? 24 to 32 hours. It's a root of a tree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 20, yeah, 24 hours to 32 hours of the psychedelic trip. But apparently it's a quite a brutal experience. Yeah, it's really Physically rough, demanding. Yeah. yeah, you're nauseous. You can't sleep for days. And But it resets the opiate receptors. So one thing that's about iboga is it's a complete, if you're a heroin addict or hooked on prescription painkillers, there's a 90, 95% success rate. Yeah. Whereas if you go into rehab, I think it's just crazy. I think it's like 90% rate, relapse, uh, rate. relapse rate. Yeah. You know, which is because once people, they rush people through the withdrawal uh, process. Programs, in, you yeah. know, in rehab. One thing I'm going to say about ayahuasca is if you are, if some people are listening and they want to do it, get off drugs, whatever it is, you, b- before you do ayahuasca, you have to be clean. If you are taking any kind of drug, antidepressant, benzo, yeah, okay. opiate, and then you do ayahuasca, it's gonna you're going to get you you're gonna get serotonin syndrome and potentially die. Really? That's why, that's why a, lot of, and a lot of uh, people say, oh, I've heard people have died with ayahuasca. Yes, not from had, the ayahuasca. They've had a either. combination because the ayahuasca re- releases so much serotonin. And if you're taking another drug on top of that, it's just an overload. Yeah, right. Yeah, your body just can't handle it. So, yeah, you, you touched on, take, pull that in a tiny bit closer again. Um, you touched on a little bit about like the general experience of ayahuasca. So did you get the purging and the shitting and all that? The first time I did it in Denmark, I didn't get the purging. So the first night I just went to the toilet a lot. Yeah. yeah I, I was, everyone else in the room, there was 18 people in the room and you don't know what it's going to do for you. It, 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 it kind of gives you what you need. Mm. But I'm looking around the room and there's people going through shit. You know, there's one girl crying so hard. And she, it sounds like she's in pain. Mm. Um, and there's another guy in the corner screaming. One guy in the corner was a snake. He sat, sat upright on his yoga mat, like hissing like a snake. Another guy was a jaguar. <laughs> wow. But for me, because I had just gone through, I was wondering why am I, because I, I was ready for it. I was prepared, like I knew that you could potentially have quite a traumatic experience. Mm. And I was thinking, why is mine so amazing? overwhelmingly just full of love and happiness just i was sat there lying on my yoga mat didn't move for like four to five hours really just in this bliss but it's because i the the last thing i needed was a brutal experience i'd just been through one yeah it basically brought me back yeah that experience it showed you what it was like to feel those emotions it did it did yeah because in that experience i was thinking about my friends, my mom and dad, all the people that meant something to my life and I was just filled with love and I realized, wow, you have so many important people in your life that you don't mm. appreciate. So, yeah, it was quite amazing. And But I went to the, yeah, going back to that, I was going to the toilet a lot. Other people, most people in the room were purging, they were yeah. throwing up. But for me, it was the other end. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I must Some have Some people get the, both. Yes, uh, well, the, I did it again, actually, in Spain and I had both. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. A lot of people um, are like kind of, I guess, like fans of the purge in a way because it feels like it is like this release of bad. energy. It is, yeah. Because like it's one thing to have, pur- you know, you're sick on food poisoning. It's horrible, you know, like yeah. you're actually sick. But being sick on ayahuasca is not actually that bad because you, you're releasing something. <laughs> it's like a relief. Yeah. Getting rid of this negative 
Does it energy. feel like you're getting rid of energy as it opposed does, to just yeah. vomit? It does, yeah. And you feel the next day you feel amazing. It complete, it's a complete uh, detox. Phys- physical detox as well. You know, I see people going out doing these, uh, was it colonic irrigation yeah, or whatever yeah, it is? Yeah. So just drink some ayahuasca. <laughs> you'll get much better, yeah. And you'll, have a, you'll get something out of it. So the first time you did it for two days in a row, right? Yeah. And then, so then a separate time that you've done it yeah. in Spain. So what made you do it then that time in Spain? I think I rushed into it. So it was a week later. I had such an amazing experience on it. I wanted, I wanted to, because I heard stories that people see more. I, I saw a lot of things. There was some kind of entity there. Very hard, to, again, to put into words to describe. I just wanted to know more. I wanted, I was fascinated by it. I, I wanted to go deeper. Um, but I, I did go deeper. So I was in a rush. I, I found another shaman in Spain the following week. I just rushed into it. I just wanted to know more. I wanted to experience more. And I was sick. I was, you know, uh, diarrhea, pretty bad. But I had zero experience. Nothing oh, happened. Really? Like nothing. It's and then I did it again. Nothing same. happened. It was weird. And then... But then I, I think it was about a month after. That's when I realized, well, I don't, I think nothing happened because. You didn't need it. I didn't need yeah. it. I was rushing into it, you know, like. Um, That's kind of. That was kind of a lesson in itself. Yeah. You know, like stop, because I do, I rush into things. I don't think things through. Mm. I know this, so I need to kind of, you know, be a bit more aware of this. <laughs> there, there's a thing like, so with me, like I definitely like want to do it for the experience of doing it. And I, I really do. I respect it and I'm interested and it's that same sort of thing. Like I really want to know, but then I'm at a place in my life right now. Like I got really sick two years ago now where I almost died from a kidney failure. Oh wow. So, and it fuck man, when you were saying the story of like not wanting to come off the drugs, basically I crashed my snowboard, elbowed myself in the kidney. I didn't know that I only had one kidney. So I was only born with one kidney. So I've gone through, done all the fucking crazy action sport shit, everything with just one kidney. Elbowed myself and then I popped the valve off the the kidney that then links to your your blood. Oh, I didn't pop it off. It, it like it it goes shut. So that it's like a pump and it kind of pumps everything through your kidney and then through the rest of the system. So then that just like basically shut. So it was like the tiniest bit was getting through it like just enough to keep me alive but i was gonna die so i did the same thing i was like man i've got all this work on i'm in america i I couldn't go to the hospital because i didn't have health care in america and then i was so scared like dude the night that i elbowed myself in the kidney and i did it to avoid hitting an old lady it was fucking the yeah it sucked and um but that night, so my, my best friend, my girlfriend at the time, and then a couple of friends from Australia were there, they were tripping. I was like, I was on the fucking floor of the bathroom, vomiting and pissing blood and like shaking from pain. And I've got like a pretty good pain threshold from motocross and injuries. And it's one thing they've always said is like every, every surgery and needles and like, you know, breaks and they're putting breaks back in place. They're always like, you've got a good pain threshold. Yeah. So then... I was shaking from pain, like uncontrollably shaking. But I also didn't know at the time that I was shaking because of how high my blood pressure was. So when your kidneys get blocked, it's like putting a fucking potato in the muffler of a car. It just builds up all this back pressure on the rest of your system. So anyway, combination of that. I lived in that. I existed in that state for a month. I threw up after every meal. After a week, a week after the accident, I was only eating Gatorade, uh, drinking Gatorade and eating uh, fruit salad because it tasted good when I vomited. That's how, like, I vomited every time I fucking ate. And, like, I didn't, like, I kind of didn't notice, but I looked back at photos. I was, like, yellow, dude. It was so gnarly. But then I went, I went back to, um, I ended up flying back to Australia. And funny, funny enough, I got some Xanax off a friend and I fucking took two Xanax because I was, like, shaking so bad from mm. the blood pressure that I didn't think they'd let me on the plane. Yeah. So I took an Endone and two Xanax to get back to Australia wow. and I was fucking out. They woke, yeah, they yeah. woke me up on, like shook me to wake me up on the tarmac in Australia. So yeah. I flew LA to Australia, no memory of it happening yep. at all. Those things will take your memory away. <laughs> yeah. You won't remember anything. But the craziest thing, so I got back to, ho- I, anyway, got to hospital surgeries, blah, blah, blah. And like, I basically got rushed to hospital. They're like, you need to go to hospital, you're gonna die. And they said I got down to like 4% kidney function. Oof. And it was just bad. 
But anyway, it was funny because they're like, what did you take on the plane? Because they like did my bloods and stuff. And yeah. I was like, oh, uh, I took an Endone and two Xanax. And they're like, well, that's frowned upon, but probably saved your life. Yeah, maybe in that because, sense yeah, you need, yeah, because, <laughs> need to yeah. relax. Right? Yeah, well, my, There's my, a place for these things for sure. Yeah, for sure. There was a... Um, my blood pressure was so high and then obviously when you fly your blood pressure gets elevated and i had wow. no re i had no fucking ceiling like i was on seizure levels of yeah. or stroke levels of blood pressure so then they were like they were like yeah dude like you're fucked like yeah. you, that that saved your life whatever you took saved your life so anyway but it was that experience of I had three surgeries. One of them was like a major surgery. They fucking cut everything out. Like it was, it was a, a full on experience. And then I didn't have any painkillers at all, basically, like after the surgeries and stuff. Um, but it was the first time in my life. It hurt so bad when I got out of that surgery. They made me stand up and piss. They took my catheter out like a day after the surgery. And I had like hundreds of internal stitches and shit. And they like, yeah, you've got to go. Like the risk of infection is way too high. You've only got one kidney. Like we can't fuck this up. You have to go home. So then I was like, I was like, yeah, cool, man. I'm not leaving. Like it hurt that bad. Like just to yeah. move a muscle was like the most excruciating shit ever. So I was yeah. like, yeah, nah, cool, man. I'm staying. Fuck you. I'm not yeah. leaving. And uh, anyway, I got up and they got me like a walking frame. And I, I was, that pain was like a different level of pain. And I was like shaking uncontrollably and i i was so close to passing out mm. and you know like you see in movies and shit like people they pass out because something hurts so much yeah. i always thought that was fake that i, I feel like i true. feel like it's real yeah yeah so <laughs> but uh but anyway i guess like that experience was it really changed me and it changed like my mentality it changed what i thought was important it yes it made yeah, me yeah. feel those like dude to my like my guy friends like australia's fucking manly man all that bullshit and i'll, I'll tell my friends all the time oh, i love you man like even you know the boys that i met on this camp we got so close within a week and like you know raul the little estonian kid that was yeah, just a yeah. fucking ninja like he left dude i fucking love you man i'm so glad i met you like it, yeah. it changed me to where i really really value good people yes and i appreciate yeah. it and then I went through problems with my ex-girlfriend through that time and that that's basically the reason she is my ex-girlfriend and yeah. it was like and but then i still didn't hold i didn't hold on to anything in the way i did in the past and so fast forward into like i want to do ayahuasca but i don't feel like i have to do ayahuasca yeah and I then and then i'm the like reason. yeah and then i'm like well with all of the research that i'm done i've done i'm like fuck like i just don't i don't know if i'm the person that but it's like, can you go there without needing it and be shown something? And yeah, I Sometimes, don't know. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I, with the ceremony, I went to the first one. There was a bunch of guys that turned up um, just there. Because they didn't even know what it was. They really? went because their friend said, hey, let's go and try this. They didn't have, they had quite a few of them had no experience. Mm. I think one of them had a very horrible experience. Um, so I think I think it's, it's kind of crazy if you just go there just wanting to have a high and pro nothing's probably going to happen. Mm. You've actually got to you go in with an intention yeah. leading up. You're thinking about it a lot leading up to the day. You should be nervous going in because mm. you don't know what's going to happen. But you have an intention. What do you want to get out of this? Mm. I actually like I almost prayed to it. I'm not a religious person, you know, but I remember going in because I was struggling with this fatigue, struggling with energy, struggling with these cravings. And all I said to it was, I've tried everything else. Please, please make me better. Please, I just want my energy back. I want to feel upbeat again. I want, just want to feel myself again. And please don't make me ever think of taking these horrible pills again. Take mm. these cravings away. And it worked. That's all I asked of it. Two things. I don't ask too much. <laughs> and then the follow that's why I went back the following week. I wanted to know more, you know, because I, yeah, I just wanted to go a bit deeper. Yeah, that's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's fucking, I, I mean, to me, it's cool like i love being able to share stories like that yeah because i'm such a fan and even with 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 marijuana like i've oh fuck man i just had the most horrible experiences through my childhood with uh other people around me and drugs and marijuana to where i just fucking hated it like yeah. really hated it and then when i started smoking 
which I'm glad I didn't do till later in life. I think it's important, actually. I think uh, for the developing mind, I don't think you shouldn't touch no drugs, marijuana yeah. or alcohol or anything until you're a fully grown adult, I think. Yeah. I think uh, smoking weed um, when you're young and you're developing, it's pretty bad because you can get a lot of paranoia. You know, mm. you're still trying to find who you are. You're still wondering, do people like me? You know, does this and all that like shit's just amplified. It's amplified, yeah. All that anxiety is amplified, you know, mm. so... Yeah, I wish I didn't smoke weed growing up. <laughs> did, did you smoke a bit when I, you grew oh, up? Oh, I used to sneak off every lunchtime with my friends. You know, yeah, see, that was all my friends. Smoke weed by, uh, by the, the pond next to our mm. uh, college. And I would used to come in and sit in the front of class like paranoid. Like, everyone knows I'm stoned. Everyone knows yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, just not get any work done. Just like kind of paranoid. I don't know why I did it to myself for so many years. <laughs> well, I just think it's... The, the peer pressure is definitely real The peer pressure, kid. yeah. And so I had... Like, my group of friends were fucking stoners, like, heavy. But I I never, ever, ever smoked weed until... It wasn't until I went to America. And the culture in California is so different. And I even fought it for years when I was in California. And I watched all my friends just getting high to get high. But these were kids from broken homes. These were kids that their fucking dads used to beat them. These These were kids that had a fucking shit life. And I didn't have a shit life. I had, I got bullied a lot as a kid at school, but I enjoyed fighting back. So I think that that let me get through. And I think I even that now with jujitsu, like I like fighting back. Like yeah. give me, you know, even with you, like there's not many people at the camp that wanted to roll with you. Like you're a <laughs> fucking big black belt. And I'm like, fuck, let's go. Like give yeah. it, like give me the, like I want to feel that. I want, I want to, fight back and I, I i don't know there's something in me that i i enjoy that so i yeah. think that's why the bullying never never really got to me because i always i was like yeah i don't give a fuck like i i, I liked it but so i guess i never had like i i never looked at that as like a negative in my life even though i guess a lot of kids who get bullied would look at it as like bullying is a fucked up thing to do yeah, like you shouldn't bully up, people I mean, yeah. but for me, it just it didn't it didn't mess with me the, mm. in the way it messes with other kids, I guess. But yeah. so I I just didn't have any of these reasons to get high. And then when I was a kid, my dad did like the coolest thing ever, and was basically like, if you want to fucking party and you want to you want to do whatever, then cool. But the rule is, I'll drop you off at the party and I'll pick you up at the party. And if you want alcohol, I'll fucking give you alcohol. So we were allowed to party. I didn't have to sneak off. I didn't have to do fucking sketchy shit like my friends did. And then as soon as he did that, it almost like took the cherry, like took the fucking whatever it was that made me want to like rebel. Like it just took that away. I was like, well, fuck, I don't have that now. (laughs) So like I always had like this crazy responsible relationship with alcohol. And then because of what I saw with drugs, then I, I just never went there. And then it was like, I guess I was like forced to get over it in a way when I, was, when I did grow up and everyone around me was doing coke, but no one was a cokehead. Everyone around me was smoking weed, but they weren't stoners. And if they were stoners, they were fucking killing it. And then I, I, it forced me to like readjust my perspective. And again, like what you said, I think perspective is like the most powerful thing that we've got in all this, right? Is yeah. it Because if you were able to like, objectively look at things and change your perspective based on the information that you're giving and not just go on staying like so staunch in your views then it's like i feel like that's how you grow but i think i mean i remember smoking weed to get high for fun just to see what it was like but i just i didn't get high like it wasn't a thing where i was like this Mm. is great I just felt super tired and I felt real relaxed. Tired. And it took me like a long... So then my, my ex-girlfriend's brother moved in. He was a fucking massive stone. I smoked every night. And we were like splitting the lease. So I was like, all right, dude, you do whatever the fuck you want. Like, no judgment. You're paying half the rent as well. All good. And then I was like, oh, I'll smoke a little. And he'd offer, but he wasn't ever like, oh, man, fuck, you got to do it, bro, bro. Like, it was just pass. And I was like, nah. And that was it. And yeah. then after a while, it was like, oh, you know what? Maybe. And then I'd watch like a movie and I was like, you know what? Yeah. This is actually like a 
better experience than just watching a movie like this is funnier to me it's more interesting yeah. i'm more and then it was like it was like this slow thing and then i started to like I, I never saw it as like paranoia what i saw it as was like oh you've been putting this off in your head yeah you've stopped you, you don't want to think mean. about this and yeah, then I would, true. and then I'd, I'd made, I'd made a lot of mistakes, man. I'd let a lot of people down. I'd burn bridges, and I'd always go in my head. I was always like, "Fuck that guy, man. That guy's a piece of shit." Like I'm fuck rural. Like I always was able to like intellectualize why that dude was a fucking dickhead mm-hmm. and why I was right to fuck him over, in a way. Yeah. And I, and then it was weed that was like bro this is not okay like i couldn't get this shit out of my head of like these fuck-ups i made yeah i couldn't i couldn't stop thinking about how not okay it was to 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 fuck people over yeah. and and it, not, it wasn't like i was fucking people over for like a lot of like money and but you know what i mean like someone would hire you for a job and then you didn't get on with them and you'd be like you know what fuck that guy yeah. like it was all that kind of shit and yeah. and then i it, it it forced me to think about it and instead of pulling back from that and being like oh you know what i don't want to fucking think about any of this shit i'm just i just would i'm just going to keep going and burning these bridges but it just forced me to give the, the like this like gain this perspective it was almost mm-hmm. like i could see the other person's point of view yes that's a huge thing i got from ayahuasca is a mm. different point of view yeah you can you know, see people's point of view yeah for the first you, time like i was very selfish it. in the way i view, saw things like the fuck that guy like he fucking did this to me did that yeah um you know my, my my ex-girlfriends you know but i just had finally had a i had a different perspective i saw things from when that where they were looking yeah I was like, oh wow i see i can see what mm. it, yeah and that was huge it's crazy and so i guess like i've kind of i got that th- out of weed out of weed yeah and it was and people call that paranoia and people shy away from it because it's like it is heavy to go through that but now it's like i can smoke now and i was always like oh i can't smoke and do this i'd I'd only Mm -hmm. do it right before bed or like when you feel real safe but it's like i've audited all this stuff now it's like Mm -hmm. you're auditing yourself like uh you remember when the hard drive you used to like defrag your hard drive yeah like, you'd get that on like old pcs way back in the day and yeah. you'd see like all these white bits come up and then there's all these white dots but you wanted black dot o- black dots only yeah and then it's like slowly starts to get rid of all those white dots it's almost yeah. like that's what that did for me yeah, yeah and i yeah. just went through this process and and defragmenting the hard yeah, drive yeah right? i just defragged everything because you think oh i forget about that forgetting it but you're not really forgetting it you put it in the trash folder in, yeah. but then the trash folder builds up and then what happens your computer your hard drive doesn't work as just good. it slows crashes. down so some these plants you know wherever you're taking they make you go into that trash folder mm. and truly delete these traumas yeah. these bad situations you've been in you know these fallouts that because you carry that shit around you need to get rid of it properly don't just forget it's still there you know oh it's there in a big way and now i've got to the point where i can really enjoy the experience because i've done the work now i've done the work and i feel like i feel like such a less aggressive person i feel like a less negative person Mm -hmm. Uh, and i mean i was always a positive person um before but like i had a temper like a big oh, temper. Me too. I'm and so less aggressive now. Crazy less um, aggressive. And I mean, I still, I still fucking arc up. And then, but then when you do, and then you, next time you smoke, you think, yeah, you're like, you're a fucking idiot. Yeah. Like that was yeah, completely yeah. unnecessary. And like I was having, I, with my, my girlfriend, I was having some, I, I can't remember what the argument was about, but I just fucking lit up. And it was b- like bad. Like I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have got frustrated. And then I smoked and I like, I dozed, I like zoned out to the point where I was her. Mm. And then I saw her argument and it made my argument look so retarded. Mm. But I could see my own argument was retarded. Like I, I was able to be in that, in her headspace. And then I just had so much compassion as opposed to anger Mm. and it was i wouldn't have had that unless i you do kind of alter that that state like you're still yourself but it forces you to be open to those perspectives and it's almost like 
like we are uh, we we do we have to get those perspectives it's not like you have a drug and then it, it has a perspective built in and then that chemical carries that like it's not in there it's it's all in your it's head in your head yeah it's letting you think about it it's ge- mm. it's letting you get to a place where you can uh accept it and yeah. and take it out of the trash folder and actually deal with it because yeah. we do we do have other perspectives we do have these the answers in our own heads they're just not the ones we want to fucking hear yeah i mean i think a lot of these plant medicines are like a shortcut Mm. You know, to dealing with these things, a shortcut um, of things you can get out of meditation. Mm. If you're going to meditate, and you can think about a lot of these things. I don't have time for that. Yeah, yeah. No, I <laughs> know. I wish I did, but I think a lot of perspective comes with age as well. Mm. You know, just getting old again, a bit more mature life experiences. Look at us, early thirties. I know, right? Yeah, but I'm so di- compared to what I was like a few years ago. Holy mm. shit, I'm so different. You know, yeah. I used to get mad in the internet. I post my videos. Um, and you know, haters, right, you know, to people talking shit. But I would answer back, dude. I, I did would the be, same shit. I would be angry, but we writing back. They'd write back again. I'd write back again. I actually made a mistake of making one comment on Reddit the other week, which I shouldn't have done. <laughs> what was the comment? Uh, they just someone just criticizing a film, and then I just put, "Yo, bro, do yourself a favor. Don't watch my videos." Yeah. And then he went, came back at me hard. Went, dude. <laughs> yeah. And then I actually sent him a personal message going, "Hey, sorry, man. Like, I'm glad you make like my films, but you know, I just kind of." took your comments out of context but mm. it's, it's just you can't reply to these people it's just nah. you, you can't fight hate with hate you know um yeah it's just quite an immature thing to do to start firing back online yeah. dude you know? i used to be the worst like there was this forum yeah. when i like was, when i owned like my little website that i was like doing articles and all that shit i used to get fucking people talking shit all the time and i'd go in these forums and like fuck i'd just go deep and now like i don't care and luckily I've only ever had like one bad comment about the podcast and it was with one of my, my best friends, Jeff. And it was just me and him going back and forth, mm. just shooting the shit. Like it wasn't an interview about his life and his story. It's like kind of like this, you know, it's like we're not, I mean, I'm sure there's people that are like wanted to hear Stuart Cooper talk about jujitsu on a podcast forever and we're not talking yeah. about jujitsu, but fuck man, that's not, sorry, yeah. that's what you want. That's not mm. what I want you know yeah. and it's like i think that you know you do this podcast and it's like i've got to be interested in what we're talking about i've got like it's it's got to be what the conversation that i want to have because it yeah. is the conversation i'm having it can't like you can't think about what other people want because that shit is just gonna change and there's all like you can't you can't pander to everybody but mm. yeah this guy basically was like oh you know like i wish he let you talk and I mean, in my head, it, I guess the ones, the comments that you get pissed off about are the ones that there's a bit of truth in them. Okay, yeah. And I, and I'm because I am self conscious. I'm like, fuck. I get, I'll get high, and I'm like, did I just talk way too much during that podcast? But at at the end of the the end of the day, like I got angry at his comment because that's something I'm scared of. Like I am scared right. of talking too much. I am scared of people thinking that. I want this to all be about me. I don't want it to be about me. I think yeah. it's awkward if it's about me. But at the same time, they're not in the room doing the conversation. The person might not be crazy mm. talkative. The, like, there's so many variables that go into it. Or you're having such a good conversation, like you know, like we are now, that it's like you lose track of who's fucking mm. talking because it's it's going, it's doing its, its own yeah. thing. But yeah, I mean, I I, I think that. If I was in 2009, 2008, when I started filming and I got a comment like that, I would have fucking Just blow up, right? ripped into this dude. I would have looked at his Instagram. I would have yeah. saw how yeah, fucking yeah. fat he was or how fucking shit he was yeah. at writing. And but, all. but then it's like, that's a loser thing to do. Yeah, like I mean, that's, they're being negative. And then if you reply, you're sending, you're being negative back. And I don't know, especially for us, if you've got like, a, I, had this, I learned this lesson the hard way. Um, once you have a presence online, you've got to be careful what you say mm. online because that shit stays on there. You know, a few years ago, I, I had a fallout with quite a, I don't want to say his name, it's all uh, on the water under the bridge, but I had a fallout with a particular black belt and I dealt with the situation incredibly wrong. I vented online. Uh. I re- <laughs> but you can't take that shit back. Next thing you know, it's being cut and paste on BJJEE.com. I think I just replied to a YouTube comment. Why did you take this video down? 
and I just vented. I was so angry. You know, yeah. I'm like 27 at this time. You know, um, next thing I know, it's cut and paste and made into a headline, oh. and it just bl- escalated everything. So I was. And then you wanted to defend back, yourself. I had to and defend myself, and then looking back, I dealt with that situation so wrong. I was so immature the way I did that, and I probably came across as a right dick. Yeah. I mean, I definitely did come across as a dick, but man, we all have these situations in life. We all make mistakes in life, but for us, they're recorded. You can't, you've yeah. got to be careful, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's, so, there's definitely like, that was one of the things with, I just didn't realize that the podcast would even do good yeah. at all. And now I'm like, fuck, all this shit that I've like not done right. You're just kind of like waiting for someone to bring it up. And then you're yeah. like, dude, I just I fucked up. Just yeah. I was a kid. And like, it's crazy, man. Like I think about a lot of the stuff I did when I moved to America, like I was fucking partying and like chicks and just out of control. But it's like, I don't want to like make excuses for myself, but it's like, man, I was a fucking kid. I was a kid and I grew up in a small town. I didn't go on a fucking airplane until I was 18. And that airplane was to go and work for a magazine in Melbourne and then I spent six months at that magazine and I said fuck that and I started my own online thing and then I bought a camera and then I had this taste of success and it was the first time I ever had money and then I got flown to America and then I got given a ridiculous fucking wage in America to live and then on top of that wage I was getting all this other work so I didn't I don't even think I owned a pair of fucking Nike shoes until I was 22 and living in America Mm. like we didn't we didn't have like a lot of cool shit i never felt cool i was never a cool person as such and then all of a sudden i'm this 22 year old kid in america with a with an australian accent that everyone wants to fucking hang out with because girls like the way he talks and that's a lot to take in Mm. and in the moment i'm not sitting there thinking hey man you should fucking you should get this in check like blah 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 blah. you're just a kid you don't really know yet anything about this stuff like i didn't pay any taxes i didn't fucking do this shit i sold cars i bought more expensive cars like just super dumb shit and as well uh, and it's probably similar for you like i didn't have any fucking parental supervision i was Mm. living in a frat house like it was just me and a couple other boys and it was just out of control and it's like you know i don't want to like it's like you, you got to, I guess, forgive, not forgive yourself, but you got to be okay with everything. Yeah. Because at the end yeah. of the day, like, you can't change it. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, I fucked up so much stuff when Just I was... Take at, lessons from it, you yeah. know? Yeah. But I didn't realize... It's like you can't... You don't know what you don't know. And I just didn't know. I just didn't know that the things I was doing, I was just riding a wave and I was mm. like, fuck, maybe this is what everyone does. Maybe, mm. maybe this is what happens when you're 22 when you move out of home. Like yeah. maybe this is, and then you've got the freedom. I didn't have to go to work. I, I got to film what I love to film. I would have gone out to those motocross tracks and I would have filmed those riders, whether I was getting paid to or not. Mm. You know, like you live in the fucking dream. And at, at that point you've got, you're so confident and you've got so much that you feel like is like going for you. And it, I don't know, like it's a weird, it's a weird place to be. And I think then for like the average person that watches what we do that they, they they're not getting thrown any of these things that i was as a kid like at 22 they were probably in uni and they're probably working at coles and they were just trying to get by to get to uni and their life was very structured very uh organized and they kind of knew what to expect i was living in this place where i didn't know what the fuck to expect i didn't know whether i was going to be in alaska or fucking like Africa I didn't know where I was going to be tomorrow and it's like you you get so used to like living and it's like this it's like this weird it's like excessive in a way Mm. even though it's not like I was buying fucking Lambos and shit like I didn't have excessive money but the lifestyle was excessive it was so exciting it was so addictive to be to like live that way I don't know if you felt like that as well sorry if it felt like how like it, it felt like it was like addictive to just keep doing whatever the fuck yeah, you wanted absolutely. to do, you yeah, know? Yeah. Like you just had, you the had that ultimate freedom. You, yeah. 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 It does, it just takes over you. Did, yeah, you um, found that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a weird place to be when you are young. Yeah. And then I guess it's only when you get perspective, you're like, damn, that was weird as fuck. Yeah. 
and it's just like a yeah i don't know so anyway it's like now yeah and th- i guess all of that you do not ever knowing that you're gonna have a profile like you just like oh i'm the dude that's behind the camera yeah like no one's gonna know who i am yep and then now you're like oh shit everyone like you're you like you said you are a brand yeah it's, it's kind of it's crazy isn't it how social media is this change it's very important to have like a good social mm. media follower now you know it's gotten me jobs all around the world just because i have a certain amount of followers mm. you know it's kind of crazy what the way the world is going i think that like are you across any of the like youtube vlogger kind of dudes like logan paul casey neistat like yeah i follow that casey guy yeah that's I like his stuff, and he's got he, he is famous just off YouTube, you know. Fucking crazy, uh, right? I know. I had the idea to start doing more blog stuff, but I just don't like being in front of the camera. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, I like being behind it. It's a weird one. Even yeah, like the podcast. I was like, fuck. I really just don't know if I want to be the dude that's in front of the camera. Yeah. But I feel. Once I started doing it though, it was just this, like it, this is what matters is like the actual, the, the conversation, like in the moment is what matters to me. Mm. Like I don't even really listen to them once they're done. It's like, I just enjoy this, this part. And then if you enjoy this part, then I guess you have to be okay with the other parts that, that come with it. But I think that, I guess my point with that before is like the world's changing to where like people want to like personalities are are more important than they've ever been and it's like Mm. you got to think that it almost started with like the kardashians because it's like they were famous for nothing like that people just were super interested in those people and i feel like that's kick-started a culture of being interested in people more than what they do yeah which is fucking bizarre like that like that um that kid that i was saying that rapper lil xan Mm. It's like, and uh, do you know, uh, like that Takashi Six Nine? Have you heard of that dude? He's like the crazy yeah. guy with like the green hair and shit. Yeah. He's only put out like fucking ten songs, man. But he's retardedly famous, like one of the biggest. I don't know why. <laughs> but because he's crazy, people yeah. want to follow the crazy. People yeah. want to watch. They just want to watch him. Like he's Instagram live and every day, and he's blowing up his story. People don't give a fuck like Mm. the music we're in this weird place where it's like the music is almost the side thing now but it's like it's like you kind of almost have to have a reason to follow someone but it's like it's only just got to be like a little like okay so you you put you're a rapper so then it gives us like this license Mm. to like follow you and then it's like yeah put out some songs but and i mean his songs are massive i guess just because of his following but it's like musically there's nothing really like special to like about the guy but these mm. people are just fucking riveted to just follow this person and it's it's probably on a, like a micro scale what people do with you they're like interested yeah, in following stuart cooper they were following me definitely because of my journey i would make posts all the time about and i uh, just arrived here in miami with cyborg brew um, and then i'm off to new york i think people were following my journey yeah. they were interested in the story of what i was doing as well literally traveling the world gym to gym to gym so that definitely you know uh, captivates people yeah for sure you know i actually look back at some of my films and (laughs) absolutely some of them are terrible but maybe people just following the journey more than natural films well i think too like you've got to look at you've got to hold yourself to the standard of what other people were doing Hmm. and who else was there yeah yeah you were the dude like yeah. you, and now i mean like you got flow, flow grappling now, and yeah. you know you you late like you're starting to get people doing it but like yeah professionally now like really good people doing it now mm, but you which were, is great you know it's, it's awesome yeah but you were like one of the first guys that people could follow you were the first person with access yeah because i i guess that's probably a part of it as well it's like the access that you can give people and it's like i think that's with the podcast is like i'm lucky that i have access and you had access as well and it's like i've got access to to certain people because of my film stuff and if i i don't have access to them i can send them my film stuff yeah and i can be like hey like yeah i'm legit this is the stuff i've done and then it's enough like when i went and saw mark hunt today i was like hey this is the podcast is what i do it's like 
if you don't, you, you, it gets going because you have access. But then once you have access, it's almost like you can just kind mm. of write your ticket based on what you've previously done and yeah. who you've previously had access to, if that makes sense. Yeah. In the first few films I made, I had to really kind of get permission, ask, ask, yeah. ask, and then I turn up, introduce myself. Hey, I'm doing it. Tell them why I'm doing it. But after doing a certain number of films, I'd just message, uh, who's an example, you know, like Bruchesha, hey, I want to come and do a video with you. Awesome, yeah, come down, bro. Yeah. Because they already know, you know, the seamless stuff. So the access is, you know, an important part. <laughs> and I think that that's what people enjoy following as well, is because they wish they had that same access. And yeah. it takes a while to develop that as well, oh, a long yeah. time. That's what I got a message um, on the podcast the other day. I actually haven't replied to the guy yet. I, I replied to him, but he sent me a message that I still haven't replied to. So I'm going to answer his question, I guess, now. But he, he's like, I want to start a podcast, blah, blah, blah. So I just said, look, the social media is super important. Get good equipment and just do it. Don't expect. Like, I didn't expect any of this. Like, honest, honest to God, when I started the podcast six months ago, I did not expect to be sitting here talking to you. There was no, I've been caught out so many times before with having like Wonderlust. Mm. I'm like, this is what it's going to be. I'm going to be, ma like I wanted to make movies. I wanted to write and direct movies. And it was like, I got so focused on that. And it's like when you, when it doesn't happen, then you stop believing that you can do it. And then when you stop yeah. believing, then it's like you, it, everything kind of falls off. And I kind of got a little bit like that with films because yeah. it felt like I'd, hit the ceiling in motocross in a way um that is a huge part of success is believing believing you yeah. can do it yeah and i, I, I kind of learned that recently you know what what made you um that? with jujitsu competition actually you know it's only recently before i never like i kind of i always wanted to be a jujitsu uh, athlete you yep. know but then I fell into the films and when I was making all these films, I was getting smashed by the best of them. You know, I was a purple belt, brown belt, trainer with Cyborg, a brew, Marcelo Garcia, these guys are killing me. So it made me think, what, why am I, I'm, I'm never, I'll never be that good. It yeah. was almost bad for me getting smashed by this many world champions. Yet all these people are thinking think, that you're getting all yeah. this training and like yeah. how much, yeah. But I was just getting beaten up all the time. Like, I'll never be that good. Why am I doing this? I'll never reach that level. And then... As I got, when I got my health back, I got the job in Singapore. I started training hard and I don't know what happened in the ayahuasca experience, but it, it made me believe in my ability a bit more. I got my health back, I got my power back, my explosiveness, I was training hard. And then I started training, a few guys came in, you know, who were professional jiu-jitsu athletes and I rolled with them and I did particularly well. And I was like, oh, I'm actually doing pretty good here. And then I um, entered a tournament, you know, the Boa Super 8. Mm. And a lot of it was, I, I did surprisingly well in that tournament. It, it was just because of the belief, I realized, oh, I can, I can do it. I, I believe I can do it. I believe I'm at that level mm. now. You know, was, that was the first black belt tournament I did. It's and crazy. my first match was against Felipe Pomansky. And the second match was DJ Jackson. I mean, DJ Jackson's an eight time world champion. I know. Mm. He beat me by three points. But that was my first black belt tournament. And that's even, I've got even more confidence to compete again now. Yeah. You know, just believing that I can do it. You know, whereas before, like, going in, you'd be like, no, this guy's an eight-time world champion. He's going to kill me. But if you think like that, he will. Mm. He's just going to run you over. You've got to believe in your own ability. Believe that the techniques you do to everybody else in the gym can work. will work at the highest level. It's just take, it took me a long time to realize that. So. I, what was your like expectation though because i guess the to with boa no just in general like in terms of competition well i guess that was the first main one so like yeah what was your expectation um, did you have any or were you just super open-minded but before when i've competed i've always been way too self-conscious you know like too aware of everything that's going around me too aware of the crowd watching you know like what people are going to think but with this one i I was like, just go out there and have fun, mm. you know, like just forget that the crowd's there, forget that all these people are watching, forget that it's live and flow grappling, you know, none of this is going to be here one day anyway, you know, mm. like what does it matter what people think, just go out there and prove to yourself that you can compete at this level, just go out there and do what you always do in training, mm. and it worked, you know, I, my mind was pretty sharp that day actually. Yeah, it's crazy, like I, I think that the weight of expectation that you put on yourself is 
probably what cripples more people than anything else. And it's like living up to expectation. And I think that that's why I think the podcast is doing well is because I genuinely didn't have expectations. There was no weight on me Mm. to do it. And I've found myself a couple of times in the process of this going like, oh, the numbers weren't that good this month. Maybe people are losing interest. Maybe people don't care. Like, and then you sort of start that self doubt. Yeah, that self doubt. And then, and then it didn't last long. Whereas in the past, it, that did last like a really long time. Like, yeah. it seemed like one L would just fuck me up for a long time. Yeah. But then I'd put on this front of being like super confident, like I didn't give a fuck. But, but now it's I don't know. It's like I've gotten to this place where it's like, dude, whatever's gonna happen will happen. Whatever's happened before it's happened and I can't change that so I don't know it's like this this place but it feels like when you don't have expectation of yourself as a weight that it's like it's a backpack yeah and if you load that fucking thing up with expectation then you're never going to get to the top of the hill yeah like you have to like let go you have to only put in that fucking backpack what you need food water and a hammock and and some fucking bear spray you know what I mean and it's like then you'll get to the top of the hill but if you've got if that backpack's overflowing with this expectation that you're going to get to the top then it's going to make it harder for you to get there if that makes sense yeah so it's like i don't know whether it's an age i don't know what it is but it's it's almost like that expectation or like i figured out how to unweight myself from that expectation in a way but i guess getting back to what this kid said is he was like oh it's doing so well considering how long you've been doing it blah 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 and i was and he's like how long i just said to him look dude you just gotta hustle and i was like first things first to get yourself like a, a good deck like a good pitch deck get some good photos send it out to people try and look legit even if you aren't quote unquote legit look legit fake it till you make it and then just hustle just get people on get people on that are interesting and just trust in the conversation that you'll have and if it's good enough it will resonate and if it's not it's not yeah. and be okay with that don't mm-hmm. try and be good at a thing that you suck at and then he's he replied and was like oh the awesome awesome feedback um how long have you been on the hustle and it's like well i've been on the podcast hustle for 10 years it started mm-hmm. the day that i fucking started working for myself because it's all these relationships it's all of the like you said, it's that, um, you know, you get to a point where people know enough about your work or they respect your work to where you people do pick up the phone, people do answer the call. And it's like the people that I got on the podcast at the start were the people that I'd done good things with in the film side of stuff. So it's like you, you've been on the hustle for fucking 10 years as oh, well. Yeah. It's like every, there's no... And, and when you decide day one to start a business like this guy with his podcast don't expect to to have the same results as people that have been on that hustle for 10 years even though the podcast hasn't been around for 10 years it's it's all so cumulative and you know i guess the same could be said with with where you're at now is like the stuff and you know competing in boa it's your first black belt tournament mm. there's maybe people that said like oh why is he getting an invite into that i think a lot of people did wonder it but actually, it's, it's, they didn't know i had i don't think people knew I actually trained like full time especially now mm. um i remember dj jackson he was like yeah i wondered why you were in the tournament you know i think you just thought i was a cameraman just a filmmaker yeah. you know but i've been training pretty for a long time now yeah how long so, have you been training about 10 years now but seriously i think probably like the last two years i've been training like seriously like a professional athlete like so twice you, a day every day you got your black belt fairly quickly then i think i did seven or eight years really i think i actually need to count up yeah i'm not actually sure did you who so who gave you your black belt uh lucio sergio de santos okay so i've been with him since day one yeah so he's based in uk he's mm-hmm. got academies in southport and manchester so yeah and yeah because yeah, I, I mean that's where like not where i'm at like fuck i really just started but like i i can't make it to all my classes at my home gym like i train with gala brothers mm-hmm. which is a uh, uh fabio galab's like a f- super well respected black belt mm-hmm. and still very active competitor and i just have never at class but i'm training yeah. 
so it's like i'm like fuck i'm never gonna get i'm never gonna get any uh like i'm I'm not gonna progress in terms of the Mm. belt even though i feel like i'm really progressing in my jujitsu which is like i don't know seems like a it's like a hard spot to be in because like i want to go to class and i want to get the recognition there for the work but it's like i'm just i'm not able to put in the work there which is like kind of tough yeah I mean, Bo, that's why I wanted to do it, Bo, is actually show people I'm not just a filmmaker. I can actually, yeah. I can roll jiu-jitsu as well. But then I did quintet right after that, but that didn't go too well for me. Yeah, you got choked, eh? Yeah, one, one mistake. One mistake, man, mm-hmm. one mistake. And you can't do it again. You can't tap hands and go again. I just fucked up, you know? <laughs> it's crazy, like, even... That's all it takes. Because <laughs> I was very confident after Boa going into mm. quintet. Because there was no one in that, apart from Joao Assis and Richie Boogeyman, that was at the level of the guys in BOA. Mm. BOA, much higher level guys. So going into Quintet, I was quite confident. I've just, I've just fought DJ Jackson, Felipe Pomansky. I should be good. And I fought a gen, an unknown, an unknown guy, High Sam Reader. And holy shit, he caught me by surprise, you know, and strangled the shit out of me. That's jiu-jitsu. <laughs> jiu-jitsu yeah. is a motherfucker. Yeah. It's crazy though, like even today when we rolled, so like we rolled at, um, at the camp at Absolute MMA in Phuket and then like obviously you smashed me, like there's no, I, was never, I wasn't going in there like, oh, I'm going to do well, but like I went and I watched what we did, what our role and then we, like, you, we even spoke about it to where you were telling me what I was doing wrong and then it's like today I was like, oh, I'm going to have a, a, a crack. Yeah. And I'm going to keep you off me for longer because it's not an if, it's, yeah. a wh- it's not if, it's when. But it's like I, I did better. T- I feel like I did better today. But then it's like once that one thing is gone, it's like yeah. you're preventing one thing. And once, once it's like your knee touched that mat and then you mm-hmm. knee cut into side control, it's, it's yeah. over. Then you're in, you're in mount and I'm getting yeah. fucking choked out. That's about the highest level. That's what it is. A game of millimeters yeah. at the highest level. You but, can't afford yeah. to be making these mistakes, you know. But it's just, it's, it's crazy to be, obviously, at my super beginner level. It's still, you can, you can yeah. see that one moment. You can yeah. see that one moment where it's like a meme. It's at this point, Jace knew he fucked up. Yep. But it's, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's crazy that it's the same when a black belt rolls with a white belt. There's one moment that leads to the... Yeah. position being gone and then no recovery beginning of the end and then it but it's a, it was the same for you where like one mistake it's just yeah. more of a fight in the yeah. in the time between that one moment and it would have been the same to where there would have been a point of no return for your opponent if you got to impose your game yeah it's a crazy fucking it's a crazy sport yeah and you can just get caught and imagine like MMA, that's a whole different story, you know. More variables. So anyone can beat anyone any, any given day, really. Mm. You know. It's so hard to pick it's fights. Got, it man. has to be your day. You know? mm. I, and then you see guys that just have their their day a lot. Oh, they, yeah. Yeah. They really do. It's just always their day. Yeah. And like, man, it's, that's what's very impressive because on the day, the day itself, the competition day, it's all mental. All the mm. physical preparation is done. It's just it's all up here. You know, yeah, that, in that right, that right zone. And that's what exper- you can't, that's what you get from experience, mm. you know, learning how to deal with the anxiety, learning how to deal with the nerves. How do you just trying to find your way of performing at your best, you know, mm. just trying to get in that. That's what I did for Bo. I was trying to find that perfect state of just uh, as, as, like a Zen, a Zen state. I'm not thinking, I'm mm. not thinking about anything. I'm just reacting like I do in, when I'm training every single night. You're not thinking, you're in that state of no mind, as they say. You're just reacting, you're just flowing mm. from one technique to the other. There's, when you compete sometimes, I'm like, oh, well, that person's watching, that person's watching, what if he does this? What if he's gonna stop this sweep? Then you're not in the moment. You've gotta find a way to get in the moment, mm. you know? It's, with me, I wanna do more competitions because at every competition that I've done, I haven't got to that state. And it's like, I almost don't give a fuck what happens jujitsu wise. I just want to get to that place where I really don't have any thoughts going into it. I think you need a certain amount of time put in. Like you, you have your game, you have years Mm. in the sport. So you, your body or you're letting your body take over at that point. You've been doing jujitsu that long. You have your game that it's just muscle memory going, Mm. you know, you're just, you're just flowing. 
from one technique to the other. Sometimes I do things in training. I'm like, how the hell? My body just did it. I didn't even think about that. Mm. You know, I'll just get, I'm pulling off arm bars from my guard for the first time ever now. You know, oh, gonna, yeah. It's, um, yeah, I'm just doing it without even, you know, f- planning it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think that m- you're just spending so much time, like you're a full-time <laughs> coach at, at Tiger and it's, yeah. you know, you're really getting to, it's like I'm sure there's guys at their job like, carpenters and shit they just hit nails in they don't even fucking think about it yeah they don't think about it just do it done so i guess it's it's just that that time yeah with with thailand you've said that you really like the culture here and i mean this is my first trip to thailand and i kind of get it like i I get i get what you mean because i feel really unburdened of like dumb shit of like a lot of it's financial troubles like your mortgage or i've not paid the bill i've not got insurance you know a lot of these things don't matter here mm. <laughs> you know they don't <laughs> you don't need a driver's license you just the police you know i should really say this 500 baht 500 baht they'll you know they'll leave you alone uh, so you don't need insurance on a car or on a bike you know uh, you should have insurance you should have insurance in case an accident happens um, but just accommodation, you know, um, you don't need to buy a house out here. You just you rent one. It's, it's cheap. Food's cheap. It doesn't matter. You don't need a fancy car out here. You don't need the nice jeans, the, the, the mm. fancy watch, all these things, the nice curtains. Because we're in, it's in a very outdoor culture. You're always out doing things. It's too fucking I, hot I'm, inside. I'm never, in, I'm never in my house. So I'm, every time I go back to my house, I'm usually just sleeping. Yeah. So... I don't need all these, especially at this point in my life. Anyway, I don't need all these materialistic things. And that's what I like about this culture. It's very, it's not very materialistic at all. When I go back to England, it's kind of hard, you know, like um, earning money. You know, I find I'm just working, working, working just to get through the month, just to pay the bills, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. It's just different out here. It's hard to really put your finger on what it is about this culture. It's so like, I love it. Yeah, for me, like, I'm, it's like, you're not stressed, like, oh, fuck, where am I going to park? Can I park here? I'm going to get a ticket. Uh, It's like, just fucking park. There's no rule. And then I'm walking down the road, like, you know, I said before, I've got like a K walk to get from the hotel to here and I had all my shit and and the side of the road's non-existent. Like, it's fucking food stands and shops and then the road. And there's buses and there's traffic and there's scooters. Not one person beeped at me. And I was taking up the fucking road. And the the bus driver just slows down and he pulls out around you. And, like, you're not trying to be a staunch dude that's just going, fuck you, I'm here. Like, you move over when you can. No one's beeping now. Like, it just seems like there's not as much... I don't know like people just don't give a fuck because it's <laughs> like just everyone's just yeah. everyone's just trying to get at night red lights don't really mean too much you gotta be careful one thing i'll say about phuket which i don't like is the roads mm. it's dangerous driving here you know, but especially on those bikes it's just yeah no rules really but at the same time no one's like angry when you cut them off or you pull I get it out <laughs> yeah you because i'm used to the english the roads west, yeah you know like in england we're going down a main road it, then there's a, a road on the left. Those cars are waiting until the main road is clear. Mm-mm. Here in Thailand, Mm-mm. you've got to assume you're going down the main road and that big fucking bus is going to pull right out in front of you. So you better be ready. Or they're just going to, the car that's parked on the side of the road, they're just going to open that door without even looking if yeah. anything's coming. They just don't think. <laughs> well, so you have to be prepared for it. Yeah. When you're driving here, it's different skill you got to be prepared it's for more reactionary. anything. It's, yeah. Yes, you got to be prepared that a dog is going to run out right in front of you, you know, like at any minute, because this happens a lot. Mm. There's a lot of accidents out here, so you have to drive, you have to drive safe out here. You have to even, be careful. Even that, man, like, I'm like, I'm a full dog person. Like, I'm so soft. Like, I can be way harder on humans than dogs. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I know that there's going to be all these homeless dogs and stuff. And I Soy was like, dogs. Yeah, yeah, I was like real, like, I was like, oh, I'm going to get upset about this. They look happy as fuck. Oh, yeah. Even they don't care. Yeah. They don't have any worries in the world. Nope. Like people feed them. Yeah. Like, dude, I, I was at dinner last night and I was like, I'm going to feed this dog. Like he walked up to my table. None of them are begging either. Like, do, do you notice that? Like, not a lot of dogs are even begging. No, they don't. Yeah. I never actually thought about that. None of them, are, none of them nah. are coming up to eat your food. And yeah. so this dog just walks in the restaurant. The people don't give a fuck. Like, the people that own the restaurant don't care. 
and then this dog walks and it just lays down it's like it almost just wanted to just chill just hang out and chill like hey i'll come sit with you and so so then i got a chip i had some like french fries so then i like threw a chip on the floor and it sniffed it and then fucking didn't eat it and i was like so they're obviously not hungry but it's like even i don't know it's like even that it's like people are just like oh yeah if a dog comes in it looks hungry they'll just feed it there's no like call on the pound and then the pound's gonna come. It's, mm. it's like it descended into a place where like everyone give up trying to control everyone else and just said, you know what? Look after yourselves. <clears throat> if there's a hungry dog, feed it. If there's a hungry person, feed them. Mm. If there's a dude on the road, chill out. Like it's almost like it got so unorganized that yeah, they just said, do it, do it, just look after yourselves because we can't fucking deal with it. Yeah. And I kind of like it. <clears throat> yep. It, it's it's in like i go tomorrow it's going to be interesting to to get go back, back home go back to and, the, yeah. yeah and a lot of people are like oh it's real dirty and this and, that. and i'm like don't know if i care no yeah. don't know if yeah. i give a fuck kind of like it yeah because it's uh, yeah it's like it's it's a unique and but with that being said too the people are so fucking nice yeah most of them most of them is well it's the land of smiles most people here are just so friendly you obviously wherever you go you're gonna yeah, get, you're gonna get your miserable there. fucks but most of them are just, yeah, such happy, chill out people, you know? Mm. It's very sabai. I was very surprised. Like, obviously, Thailand's like crazy famous for lady boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was, I was really surprised at like how accepted it is. It's like, it doesn't yeah. even matter. Like, no, it doesn't. In it's Western, just but in Western culture, like, we're obsessed with that shit oh, yeah. right if now. If there's a lady boy, everyone's looking, mm. everybody's looking. But well, here, here you can't tell for a starters. I mean, some some you, of them, some you, some some you can. can't. Yeah. yeah, some you can, some you can't. Yeah. Like yeah. we we were went out with the boys the other night, and I, it was like late by the time. Like we were trying to get a kebab, as you fucking do, and uh, so we were like trying to get the kebab. So we walked into this bar, and we were with Joe from you know Joe from Absolute. Yeah. 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 So we were with Joe and we're like, oh, okay, so which side's the lady boy and which side's like the lady girl? And he's like, this late, they all just cruising. Like there's no side, there's no like side to the bar. Yeah. And uh, so we we're looking around and I'm like, and I'm like trying to pick these lady boys and we we're like asking the waitress, like, which one lady, which one lady boy? Really? And then we we're like, what about that one? Is that a lady boy, a uh, lady? And then she's like, no, 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 like giggling. She's like, that's, that's lady boy. I'm like, well, yeah, she's hot as fuck. <laughs> like, <laughs> Some of you, you really yeah, cannot you cannot, tell. You could not tell. Yeah. And I was like, I was tripping, but it's like, it's not even that. It's just like, people don't care. You know? like, there's no judgment. Like, they honestly don't give a fuck, eh? And that, yeah. like, I, I, was, I knew that it was something coming here that I was like, I've never experienced. And I, I've never had to, like, see so many, uh, like, fucking transgender people real like essentially and in in the west it's such a tab not taboo thing but it's like a hot button issue this whole trans thing and then you come here and it's like it's not an issue it's just Mm. super normal and they're sitting like we'd walk from the gym to our hotel every day and there's like 50 ladyboy massage places there's 10 bars with lady boys out the front they're like mm. oh handsome man come in man, man, man. <laughs> and you just like at the first day i was like real awkward i was like yeah. oh this, i don't even want to look this is fucking yeah. super weird for me and then uh, like the next few days i'm like hey what's happening you know like yeah. you just kind of get fully desensitized to it yeah. so that was a that was a trip yeah be careful with these massage places. It's not, it's not really a massage. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, uh, we got with last the, thing they're good at is massages. <laughs> yeah, we got the um, two free like with the camp. You actually get two massages. And Simon at the start is like, it's for one place. It's called Sports Massage. They're actual people that do it's a actual. Legit place. Yeah, this is only <laughs> for massage. And he like gave like the lecture. Yeah. And um, so yeah, we only went to that to that yeah. place because it, and it was fucking incredible like yeah. hands down best massage i've ever had yeah. have you do you know the one that we're talking about near the gym there What's it's it? like you know Spots. where the you know where the gym is an absolute and then you've got that little family mart right on the corner yeah right where the family mart is across the road and like down two little um buildings is this it's like a green building at sports mat sports uh, massage I been there. mate i'm uh, telling you like i mean i don't know whether all massages like legit ones in thailand are as good yeah. as them but like yeah. all the boys were like because obviously the training camp was like crazy hard yeah 
But all the boys like, holy fuck, that was so legit. Well, obviously, G and yeah, I was like, was oh, it, I bet was it, it was. painful? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that, then it's a good one. Yeah, if no. you, if They put you in pain. Oh, my God. Just yeah. the, like the elbow techniques that they were using. There was probably a bit like, because my forearm, man, my forearms got like super burnt out through this mm. camp, eh? Hey? Like all, all the gripping. Like really, I really struggle with. But yeah. I struggle with it in the gi at home. So I, I, and I train way more gi than no gi. Like it's probably 70, 30 mm. in the gi. And obviously you're gripping way more. And the week before I came, like uh, my forearms were just already chewed out. And then here I struggled and she was pushing on them so hard to where I was like, you know what? This is probably not good mm. for my, for my muscles. But if they weren't injured, it, it would have been yeah. fine. But yeah, it was fucking amazingly good eh? i was like man this is probably gonna be dog shit yeah. but yeah so I, it's it's interesting hearing you talk about thailand that first day we spoke and then i tried to like think about that mm. lifestyle a little yeah, bit more a great, and kind of like a great place it. for uh, people like us digital nomads you know mm. uh, there's more and more people doing that now they're making money or they're doing their own thing making money online and they just go bounce from country to country to country and <laughs> you avoid paying tax that way because the tax man doesn't know what to do with you yeah you know, that's like because i'm not in england i'm not in america i'm not like that's how i avoided it for years i was in a different country all the time mm. you know but um Chiang Mai is a real cool place for digital nomads is that you know, in thailand as well yeah north of thailand and it's really cheap so a lot of people have like startup businesses there yeah because so, accommodation is cheap food living is cheap and you have the time, you know, to build up whatever it is you want to build up. You know, there's more and more people doing that now. It's never too late for people to just quit their job that they hate and just mm. do their own thing, you know? Especially with the way the internet's going now. Yeah, the, in the internet has opened up it's everything. changing everything. We're doing this know? podcast right now. Thousands and thousands and thousands yeah. of people will listen to this. And what I love about the internet is bringing, uh, especially podcasts, it's bringing awareness yeah to so many things like the things we've been talking about today i would never have heard of no. a lot of these psychedelics or you know if it weren't for listening to podcasts yeah you know it's it's uh it's spreading a lot of useful information it's happening a lot if you draw a parallel to jiu-jitsu as well yeah like I, I joke with a couple of the brown belts at the gym as that i'm a white belt in the gym but a brown belt on youtube because it's like <laughs> you can just watch so much like information and like you mm. look at a dude like Lockie, like so lachlan giles that i just craig uh, jones professor yeah i always yeah. have to say full names because lachlan giles, yeah, yeah, yeah if i don't awesome just amazing like, jujitsu he's not as well known as craig but fuck, he's an animal. he's awesome i've got 15 kilograms on him and when i was rolling with him holy sh <laughs> yeah you, he said it was legit like you guys really went out of it yeah he definitely beat me it was a, so it was a hard time oh yeah 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 what what he's is it though. like what is it with him with him he's been like he just he had an answer for everything i was doing things that usually work against most people he knew what i was doing before i even he saw the initial setup the little details i said like, oh he's going for a reverse delahiv or he's going for a knee bar he recognizes what's coming before it comes you know or you know what i'm setting up i'm faking this but i'm actually going this but he knows what i'm doing he knows what i'm faking mm. and what i really want you know so it's just it's just a awareness you know he knows all the techniques i know he knows all the pathways and he has counters for them that was so that takes the strength and athleticism away because you know I, like i said i've got 15 kilograms on lachlan but it didn't matter it and didn't it, matter not just weight size yeah like your surface area your longer like yeah limbs yeah, yeah. are longer every everything you take up more physical space on planet earth than yeah him. so it's like even that there's something to be said even even for that you yeah. know and it's like yeah the way that he can kind of overcome that shit yeah but it's it's crazy the like the levels and there was even i was trying to do that um honey holes like back step on yeah, you today yeah. and so it again, was like i knew what was i knew right away because yeah. i do it myself and i knew sort of counters to the but i did that on three people today i heal yeah. i heal hooked three dudes nice. with that and it's like they all laughed and they were like Fuck, yeah because i'd never seen it before yeah and it, it, it's like when you yeah when you don't have the answer or you don't know what's coming it's almost like you can do whatever you want but yeah. when you do it's like then it really like the the script is is flipped and 
yeah it, it was cool to like really watch you guys and even when you rolled uh jace Lockie's yeah. brown belt yeah it was like he was like you almost had an answer for him but then at the same time like only i guess five minutes but it's like yeah you struggled to really get all the way through every yeah. every defense and it's yeah. it's he was so good. he is good yeah. it's so interesting to watch when you have a deeper understanding of like what's really going on and it's like if you were to try and choke rear naked choke me it wouldn't take long like at all but you were trying to choke him for like a long time yeah i couldn't do it just mic, <laughs> just micro micro yeah. adjustments yeah at his neck and you would you know you've got your game and your technique and it's like then he just was just given these little little counters that forced you to either go back a step yeah. or back all the way to the start and it's it's a crazy yeah crazy thing to watch but it, it was definitely cool to see you and you and lucky yeah go at it i know it's not often i get to train with people like pure jiu-jitsu guys at that kind of level mm. you know i trained with craig jones recently um, how was that huh <laughs> bad um yeah because I mean, the size and strength isn't as big a it's difference. funny when i first oh, i've been watching craig i thought hmm, maybe i've got a good style for him because i've got a good pressure game mm. and he's quite tall and skinny but then he's not he's tall but he's not skinny he's no, quite he's, physically he's big now he's strong so I thought certain things would work on him, and when I rolled with him, I was so wrong. <laughs> so what, what was your game plan with him? Um, like to just do what I always do, get heavy on top, get into half guard and start pressuring my way through. You know, I like that weave pass, that you've squash been the legs together. <laughs> but I just couldn't even, I couldn't get close to the guy. I couldn't get close to him. And one thing about Craig is he's always pulling guard in competition. So people think he's, people don't realize he's actually got really quite an amazing top game, mm. really good guard passing. You just don't really see it very often. He doesn't need to do it. Yeah. He's, he's so good off his back. Uh, but when I rolled him, that's what surprised me as well. I was like, oh, okay, I can't pass this guard. I'm going to pull guard on him. And I'll, pro I'll, mm. probably, I'll probably have an easier time then, but nope. <laughs> was it harder when he was on top? Because no, I don't get my guard passed very much here. Yeah. You know, there's not many people that come through that are able to pass my guard, but Craig passed three times in one round. Fuck. I was like, shit. You know, and that's how J Lachlan passed my guard. He did the exact same pass. What was the pass that he used? It's a used? double body lock pass. Yeah, okay. They've yeah. been using that a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's so effective. I haven't, I actually... I'm I starting to learn it myself now. So once I learn it, once I get good at it myself, it probably won't work on me anymore. This yeah, because you'll thing. know the details. Exactly, yeah, which I don't know. So it works, that's the pass to do on me right now. I actually don't really know what to do. Dude, you know what's crazy? Yeah, put in a position where I struggle, you know? It's crazy today when we rolled. The You were trying to do some leg entry stuff on me. Yeah. And like I was like fucking getting out of certain stuff, but only because we've done it all week. If you did yeah. that a, just one week ago, I would have been a fucking dead fish. Yeah. I would have I would have not even seen it coming mm. and it's crazy to me is like everything there's like i'm putting in my own work that you can start to see that it is about knowing and having answers mm. and or almost like looking just that touch into the future to where you've got time to react because mm. like if you don't have that time and and obviously i don't want to say at all like i'm fucking good enough for you not to leg lock me but it was like you know you get in those scrambles where yeah. it's like i actually you know, know i I'm actually going. knew what you were trying to do yeah. and then i just hit the fucking eject button and yeah. i'm just so far out of there so quickly because all i've got is i have to get out before it really even starts or i'm not getting out at all and it's crazy to yeah to watch that and i can only imagine what guys like yourself and then Lockie and craig have because it's like you're just caching all this data all the mm -hmm. time everyone you ever roll like you're just getting data off these people and it's like the people that are good at jujitsu are the ones that have like this fucking 40 terabyte hard drive and they're just they're just mm. stacking that with like real time analysis and like pattern reg recognition mm. and, and stuff like that that's why the Danaher Death Squad have done so well in competition the last few years because they've learned a system of the leg game mm. that most other world championship level black belts weren't familiar with. So even though they had been training less half the amount of time as the guys that they were beating, they were able to bring them into an area of the game that they didn't know. They were more experienced. Their opponents were more experienced in jujitsu. 
but they brought him into an area of the jujitsu game that they were more experienced in mm. and they were able to tap people like uh, you know Cyborg or Brew you know Gordon Ryan tapped him Gordon Ryan's only been training I'm not sure how many years it's like seven years or seven years that's ridiculous to try you know? tap a dude that's so born and raised on yeah. jiu-jitsu yep <laughs> it's pretty heavy that's pretty amazing and you look at dudes like yeah Gary Tone and, and like <clears throat> even Nicky Ryan man like did oh you, he's phenomenal did I you watch him at Pol- Polaris did yeah. you watch his Polaris match yeah I did against uh, yeah quite a talented guy called Phil Harris a UK fellow British guy yeah and he was he was, a, he was here at uh, Tiger Muay Thai a few years ago mm. yeah he was training here but Nicky Ryan's sick you can't, it's just a, age is just a number you know mm. the guy's only 16 but holy shit he's the mentality he's that legit. little motherfucker has is crazy yeah like to just go and take on the world he wants to be the best in the world like he will he, be he knows what he wants so he will be he's already on the way you know? I just wish he was a little bit bigger he'll, he'll probably grow into himself he's actually yeah. like when I met him he came to Singapore um, John Danaher did a seminar there and Nicky Ryan came along and he's for, for a 16 year old he's pretty he's in very good physical yeah, shape yeah he's ripped you know yeah he is so you know I'm sure he's gonna grow into himself a lot there is kids like in motocross there's a kid called Adam Cincerello and he was the prodigy of all prodigies like on another level to anybody ever and uh, he barely lost a race his entire life like that's how fucking good this kid is and everyone said you're too small like it's all good now because you're on these little bikes but you'll never be able to ride a big bike now he's too big for the class that he's in so he rides a 250 cc capacity bike the biggest is a 450 and now everyone's like yeah dude you're you're too big for a 250 Mm. and he was a kid like he was a fucking dweeb and now he's like huge yeah so it's like you never know because gordon's a big dude yeah yeah he's Big yeah, what is he like six three, six four? Mm. But like, yeah, he's like two hundred and forty pounds. He's yoked. Yeah, happened quick too. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people like to suggest, <laughs> but he's young, you know. Like, um, I don't know. I don't he know. posted a picture of him today at seventeen. Did you see yeah, that? And like, he, he's pretty years, fucking jacked. Yeah, like people always accuse me of being that stuff for years. I would have thought so. Because I was always like pretty in good shape. But if you see photos of me when I'm 15, 16, I was always, mm. unless I've been doing it since I was 16. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I was always quite physical, you know, just that was just the body type I had. Yeah. So with someone like Gordon Ryan, I think, I think maybe it could, could very well be natural. Natural. It very well could not be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it doesn't, you know, it does look, it's pretty damn big. There is, is so there, I don't know. There's definitely some steroid shit going on in jiu-jitsu though, right? Because it's oh, yeah. not like they test yeah. a lot of stuff. It's, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it's it's got to be, yeah, it's got to be tough. Like you look at Lockie, he's clean as a whistle. Like yeah. there's zero, yeah, yeah. there's just zero doubt there. But then it's like how many dudes is he fighting that aren't even getting checked? Yeah. It's got to be frustrating. Yeah. Because the, the thing is, is like, it gives you this fucking crazy strength, like when you're I think on, it's in more that the, cycle. It's more the recovery, and the, than yeah, anything. and then the recovery. Yeah. You're allowed so to train, you, and yeah, you you recover quicker, so you're able to train more, get more hours in, mm. and then learn more, and then it's just going to give you that edge. Mm. Obviously, a physical edge as well. <laughs> I think though, like when I was talking to Lockie uh, on the podcast, it's crazy to feel like a guy like him to where like. Coaching would help your game, right? It definitely helped my game. As soon as I started coaching, my game got a lot better. Mm. But I think Lockie's at a point where coaching almost hinders his game. Right. Because he's Craig Jones's coach. You know, it's like that. You're they're, they're co- like you're coaching me. You know, I mean, obviously, like, sorry, you've got good guys too. So it's not like uh, you're, yeah, not discounting that. But it's like, you're not responsible for going to Polaris, competing, and then cornering for the guy who's maybe the best dude in the world right now. Mm. So it's like there's a lot that he, he, I guess he has to put more in around that kind of top-level competition. Like when you go to a top-level competition, it's all about you. Mm. So it's like it's got to be hard for, for him. I feel like he got to a point where... He does know every single technique. He's seen every game. He's got great purple belts. He's got great blue belts. He's got all these people around him to where, like, the coaching side of things does help. But mm. then, like, he's probably reached a point where it actually hurts him as a competitor, yeah. which is interesting because it's like, what do you do there? Because, yeah. I mean, I'm sure he's got aspirations of 
you know, being one of the, the best dudes in yeah. the world. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he told me he's adding things onto his game now, like his dream is ADCC mm. champion. So, it, you know, any, any little thing, if you just need to l- do a bit more strength and conditioning, get a bit stronger, that's yeah. an edge. Uh, but wrestling is a huge one. If you can just add the wrestling to your jiu-jitsu game, that's going to really, that might be the bit that sets you apart. Mm. You know, I think that's, that, that is what let him down. He had a great match with JT Torres. Yeah. Ranked number one in the world at 77 kilograms. But what separated them was the takedown, the wrestling. Yeah. You know, JT was a little bit sharper there, but now Lachlan is learning that. And I think Craig is as well. He's adding that to his game. Yeah. It's so important. You need to know it. You know, that's what led me down in quintet. I actually always trained wrestling since I've been coming here. I actually had a decent double leg on me, yeah. a decent single leg, but I can't wrestle for shit now because I've, I've got I've got three bulging discs in my neck, so I can't shoot. Uh, that's why I'm always pulling guard now. I have to pull guard. I, if I shoot and on my head, someone just pushes my head slightly or like my head goes into the yeah. rib cage, my whole right arm goes numb for about five minutes. Fuck. And my legs go a little bit numb as well. That's crazy. It's a little bit scary. Have you ever done any like decompression exercises? Yeah, I do it once a week. Yeah, once right. Once a week. What uh, stuff do you do? Um, I just do, what's it called? Traction, traction device. Yeah. Yeah, just on this machine that kind of like pulls yeah. your head up it's good and sometimes the chiropractor does it for me just gets a, a, a towel, towel around my head and he pulls my head back and you feel it popping it feels good yeah it's like pop, pop. It's, oh yeah i'm uh because i yeah i fucking held on to something way too long today that i, I shouldn't have yeah. and my neck's jacked and that's the first thing i'm thinking about is like i've done where i've tied like a towel to the doorknob and then you put it in that crack of your behind your skull and then you lay flat on your back and you just edge yourself forward. And yeah. You can just feel the weight of your head pulling your neck and like decompressing. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's like that's a good one for anyone at, <clears throat> at home that has like mm. neck issues is to tie a little yes. bit of rope to a doorknob. You can, I have, you I have can issue, some big neck issues right now. I shouldn't really be competing. I've been What's told. It, what did it come from? Um, I, I was rolling uh, jiu-jitsu here and I... Actually, it all started when I was in Singapore. I started doing a lot of tornado guard. Mm. And for my body type, I'm just not flexible enough to do it. It's just not my body type. But I kept doing it. I got good at it. But I kept, instead of going on my shoulders and my upper back, I kept going over my neck. Yeah. And I'd pop my neck, you know, just doing it slightly wrong. And then turn up to training the next day. Oh, I'm not going to roll today. My neck is sore. But then someone doesn't have a partner. I end up jumping and rolling. Then you warm up and then you don't feel pain anymore. Actually, no, I'm fine. And That's the worst thing about so, jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Once you're warm, you can do whatever the fuck you want. And this is inside in air conditioning. So this was going on for a year. For about a year, I'm doing reverse Delaheva and tornado guard and having a lot of success in training with it. But I kept going over my neck mm. and pushing it way too much. And then I came here and um, I think that I just, I rolled for a knee bar in someone. They defended the correct way and I went to, they had to be in a bad position and I went to explode out and went over my neck and that was just the tipping point. Mm. And it resulted in free bulging discs and now I've got disc on disc. Ooh. So you should have fluid in between each yeah. disc. Mine is just disc on disc. It almost looks like the disc is fractured. I'm a C5 and C6, so which runs all the way down to my thumb and my main finger here. And it's been numb since February. I haven't oh. felt these three digits since February. And sometimes if I lo- walk long distances, my feet go numb. Yeah, right. So I should, the chiropractor and the doctor said, you need to lay off training for a good six months to a year. Let your discs fully regenerate. Um, but it's so hard to walk away. Yeah, I fuck, mean, that's making me think about my uh, neck. Especially I'm like, right Eesh. now, you know, I've just reached, I'm the best I've ever been in jiu-jitsu right now. I've reached a level that I want to compete now. I'm a 33. I'm not mm. getting any younger. Now is the time to really compete if I want to. But then this happened, so uh, maybe I should take a little, a few months off, you know, six months off, and you know, properly heal and then compete. Get some but, of that PRP and fucking exomes and all yeah, that shit. Yeah, I wish I, I looked into stem cell therapy. Um, mm. but it's so expensive. Go so to Panama. Expensive. Yeah, I, yeah. I looked. That's where I looked into. It's still, still, expensive. still expensive. How much yeah. are we talking? 15,000 US Fuck. which is actually not that bad but I can't still not it. yeah it's pretty gnarly like, yeah definitely yeah, if it, I could get a sponsor or something <laughs> yeah, sponsor me some stem cells maybe they could sponsor me I'll just give them an Instagram post so what's <laughs> uh, what's next for you mate because hell um, where, where are we at here 
Two and a half hours. Oh, wow. We're deep. Does wow. it feel like two and a half hours? No. No, no. Goes pretty quick, eh? Yeah. Next, <clears throat> I'm just, right now, I'm just really enjoying life, you know? Good for you, dude. Yeah. Everything is, I appreciate everything so much right now. Um, I would love, I would love to go and I can't travel as much as I used to because of the reasons we talked about. I would love to go to New York and do some videos with Dan and her Def Squad, you know, one and Gordon mm. Ryan and Gary Tone and a few of the Tenth Planet guys. But now, you know, I have a girlfriend here and I'm also contracted to Tiger, so I have to be here and teach every day. But, it, you know, I'll, I'll maybe when next time I've got a holiday, mm. you know. Um, yeah, I'd like to take a trip over to America and do a few more videos. Hello, I, I have so many people coming here. so I'm, It's I'm, crazy, I'm man. I'm getting back into my videos again. I had a bit of a break, but I just did one with Josh Hinger. Um, working on the Craig one. Nathan, Nathan Orchard. I'm working that was on, cool. <laughs> oh, like thank that, you. Yeah. yeah, he's a great guy. Does, is uh, he the one that invented the dead orchard? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I got really tapped. interesting guy. I got tapped with one of them the other day. I fucking. I almost sucked. got tapped by one in competition last year. Really? Almost, but I knew what it was. Luckily, we had um, a tenth planet dude, Jeff. Shout out if you listen, homie. <coughs> and uh, he's like full wanky, dude. Tenth planet guy, and I was like, oh yeah, show me some tenth planet shit. And he's like, you want to try a rubber guard? So I like get. I got put fully into rubber guard, and yeah. then he's just like, Eek. and I was like, we. And he goes, yeah, yeah, that's called the Dead Orchard. And I was like, yeah, yeah. fuck that noise. Because that shit sucks. Yeah. There's some gnarly, nasty shit that those yeah. 10 Planet freaks are cooked yeah, up. Yeah, they, they've got a unique style. But um, yeah, so um, I've just done one on him. That's out to view on my YouTube channel, my Facebook page. I'm doing, I've just filmed one with um, Edwin Najmi, um, who's a Gracie Barra, a mm. black belt. He fights in ACB. Um, obviously the Craig Jones look out for that one I think that's going to be one of the best ones I've ever made the footage I have for that's amazing fuck yeah and then Lachlan Giles and then I'm, yeah I hope I'm going to plan some more you know but I'm taking my time with these videos now I think yeah. I was doing so many I was traveling so much I started rushing the videos and they resulted in pretty bad videos I'm actually going to go back and re-edit a lot of them I did oh, one yeah. I did one of Keenan Cornelius a few years ago. It got taken down because music and shit. Music rights, yeah. I was not smart enough to actually use properly copy. Well, I actually thought I had copyright free music, but it turned out I didn't. And I got I got fined quite a lot of money. Oh. Yeah, I got fined a few thousand dollars. Yeah, that'll fuck you. Yeah, yeah. Fuck it. Uh, so I had to get that taken down. And I never got round to re-editing it. So I'm going to re-edit it in small parts, though. So yeah. I think that one... Uh, I did that with the Marcelo Garcia one. It was like 90 minutes long, which is way too long. That's crazy. So now if it, people have short attention spans now. Yeah. It's going to be short four to six. Mm. You can get away with a 10 minute video if it's, if it's choppy. If it's good. Yeah. So the short video seems to be the way forward. It's you crazy know. that the videos are the shorter, but podcasts are longer. Yeah. Well, podcasts, I know. When I wake up in the morning, I'm having my coffee, my shower, I like to take my time. I put a podcast on. Mm. I listen to it. I'm walking around the kitchen, making my coffee, yeah. doing my thing. And I'm listening to a podcast the whole time and I don't have to watch it. Mm. You know, I can just listen. And then, but I'll, I'll come back to it, watch a little bit and then listen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's crazy that it's it shifted the way that it has. I, I didn't, I didn't see it coming, but now that it's here, I definitely have... I've put a lot of thought into why they're working so well and why they're so popular. And I just think it takes you back to that. Like, what's the oldest form of storytelling? Sitting around a campfire. Mm -hmm. And there's no noise. There's just like a crackle of a fire. And the only thing, you like zoned into the conversation because there's nothing else going on around you. There was no street lights. There was no road noise. There was no traffic. There was no music. There was no one distracted by a phone. It was just zoned in, only conversation. And I think that this whole podcast thing is just like re-tickled that little primal uh, storytelling yeah. kind of thing that's like in our DNA. You're getting to know people's proper stories, you know? Mm. Like, uh, I love, I think someone brought out the point of the day, like certain fighters like Kevin Lee, they come across a certain way, mm. you know, through the UFC promo videos or things they say, they think that guy's a right dick. He goes on the Joe Rogan podcast, they see what a normal, down-to-earth, mm. nice intelligent guy is you know it's like that with a lot of people you get to see who people really are 
because you've got the time, haven't you? Macaulay, yeah. Macaulay Culkin was on Joe. I haven't listened podcast. to that yet. I mean, listen to that. I, got, I, I listened to it a little bit. He seems a really normal guy, but the way media has he portrayed him. He seems kooky as fuck as well, though, in his right. own, but in his own way on that yeah. podcast, he seems like yes. very yeah, down yeah. to earth, but very, very kooky to yeah. where you're like, that's why he's such a good actor, you yeah. know? But it, yeah, you're right. You do see him. He's just a normal guy. He's he just wants, a normal guy. He, yeah. wants to, he wants to make people laugh. But he the, wants to I tell don't know, a story. My, my image of him was that he was just some drug addict mm. failure. You know, that was a one hit wonder with his Home Alone film. But no, absolutely not. It's just the way media makes it out. Do people know? know much about your story with like the addiction stuff that you've no, gone through? No, no, that's the first time I've said it. It's going to be interesting. And I think it's important because we always post the positive things. We always put post like, oh, how, how, you know, we're boasting about our lives. You know, I did this, I did that. Look how great my life is. Mm. I think it's important to show because then people end up comparing their lives to your life. Yeah. Oh, my life's not that good. I wish, look at Stuart Cooper doing traveling the world doing all these things but we all have our own little struggles i think it's important to be honest mm. about you know these things you know if it's depression anxiety you know and people can listen and then maybe they can take something from it well it helps take some hope from it it helps people because like we've had this on the podcast before where people have opened up about struggles and it's like like when you're the top of the game and what you see is like ESPN, Supercross Championship, this, that. Like, you think that like, okay, their life must be perfect. I don't have any of those things. That's why my life isn't perfect. But then when you hear a guy like, say, Robbie Madison, who's one of the most famous motorcycle riders on the planet, when you hear him go, yeah, I was depressed as fuck. I almost killed myself. Wow, yeah. And then it's like people start to think like, oh, so he has all that stuff I think I need and he's still depressed. Yeah. Right, and I think that that's what helps people. Is it's like whoa, 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 whoa. So maybe it's not the things and the accolades yeah. and the job and the yeah, that stuff helps. But if you've got that, then yeah, you can still feel fucked. Yeah. So it's like really, people need to get right with themselves and only themselves. They don't need a better job. They mm. don't need a better car. They don't need more friends. They don't like every. You've got the. You've got yourself, mm. and then. I think that also means you've got yourself to blame. And when you can realize that you've got yourself to blame and you can audit and go through, I think a process we both have, it sounds like we've both been through that process mm. of like, okay, well, I was to blame for that. <clears throat> I was to blame for this. Yeah. And I need to get right with that yeah. myself. It's like, that's when things start to fall in. And I also think it's why we're seeing a lot of celebrity suicides. Yeah. Because... Quite, yeah, we've had three big ones recently. It's fucking crazy. So yeah. think about it then on the flip side, right? So when you, uh, like, so Chester Bennington, that one fucked me up. Linkin Park was my childhood. Yeah. I've seen yeah. Linkin Park like 15 times live. Mm. Fucking love it. Love those dudes. And when he killed himself, that was like one of the heaviest things for me because that was like, and I mean, I've met a lot of famous people. I've hung out with a lot of famous people. I've like, I never got starstruck ever by people. And maybe that's why I was able, like people were cool with me filming is because you can kind of just jump on. You're not treating people any differently, if that makes mm. sense. Maybe, and I'm sure that's what you've got. You just kind of don't get awed by the people. You just kind of see him as a person. Yeah. But I think with Chester, he was like one dude where like I let myself go fucking deep down that rabbit hole of like he's more than just a person sort of thing. Yeah. And I haven't done that with too many people. So when I when he killed himself that it really fucking sucked. Yeah. And it it did make me think though when all the messages, all the comments, everything that you see is people going like what a fucking waste. Look at all the things he had. Look at what he had. Blah blah blah. He's got everything you, he could ever want and he still did that. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know what? You don't know what's going on in his life. Well, maybe it's because people like you keep telling him he's got everything. And he still feels like a piece of fucking shit. Mm. And so you're, like you're as in society, is telling you you've got everything you need to be happy and you're still not happy. Then what's the fucking option? Mm. A guy like him could buy whatever he wants. Go yeah. wherever he wants. Do whatever he wants. Every fucking thing is at his disposal. And he's still not happy. And he's still got demons. Yeah. And then we're all telling him that he should be happy because he's got everything. 
And when you can't be happy with everything, yeah. then you've got nothing. You know what's strange? Recently, I was in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City, and I saw this guy walk, going around the streets of the city, and he didn't, ha- he didn't have any legs. He had two stools. He's shuffling one stool in front of the other stool, in front of the other stool, shuffling along. He had stools for legs, begging for money off of the street. And he was probably about 50 years old, I'm not sure. Look what he has, nothing. And he wants to live. He's begging to survival. And then you have someone with everything in the world. You know, they have all the money, they've got everything, they've accomplished a lot, they're successful, but they want to end all this, they want to end it. It's kind of, it's strange, you know? Well, it just goes to show that things don't mean anything. Yeah. You have to be, you have to be happy with yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get right with yourself, you can't get right with anyone or anything. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's fucking, it's a pretty heavy spot. And that's, that's why I was, it's cool to hear the way that you talked and that the way that you said things and rationalized things. And you knew that it's fucking interesting, man, the way that you said that I knew I had a good life before so I could yeah. get a good life again. I think that's a fucking super powerful thing to say to people because, yeah, yeah like I said, I got people in my life that are struggling and they're struggling for a really, really, really fucking legitimate reason and that I think they're actually dealing with shit better than what I would be if I was thrust yeah. into the same situation. But at the same time, I think it's fine. they're finding it hard to have that same point of view. Yeah. And I, I hope that that helps yeah you know because once they do get through it come out the other end you know it just it does it makes you mentally stronger it can only make you stronger mm. if you get through those deepest darkest times and then you've got a point of reference man yep to bring you back yeah and then it i feel like once you've gone through and once you've made it out that other side then then you you don't slip in again you don't go down no. that again because you've already fucking seen it and yeah. you've already done it. You've got, it's like, I guess like jujitsu, you know, it's coming. You've yeah. seen the fucking you next learn step. learn from your mistake. Yeah. yeah. Something my parents were worried about. They're like, you won't, you won't do, do that. You won't take those things again, will you? I was like, no, I won't. Like, I don't think I have an addictive personality. Mm. It was just a mistake. <laughs> you know, there's no danger that's going to happen again. Mm. I do not want to go through that again. <laughs> Isn't it? It's interesting Ever. too, though, that you've got the, like, you still smoke weed and you still, yeah, I'm like, I'm because kind it's of, like, you, I'm careful with it though. Like, um, I only smoke weed before bed. Mm. Very rarely do I do it in the day. I'm because very, I'm, very similar. Uh, I don't know. It affects everyone differently. Like some people can smoke weed and then like uh, go and do stand-up comedy, go and mm. perform in front of a huge crowd. If I smoke weed, like there's no way I could smoke weed and come on this podcast. Mm. I just, you wouldn't get much out of me. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to like just watch a film and just be quiet. Mm. That's how it affects me. Yeah. It puts me to sleep. But for other people, it makes them talk a lot. It makes them, you know, yeah, much more vocal. So it's... I'm similar in like, I guess like one of my big insecurities in life, like if I could say what my, which is ironic, my biggest insecurity in life is about talking too much because I was that super fucking hyperactive kid and I love telling stories and I love making people laugh and I just I fucking love being the center of attention like my nickname when I was a kid was campfire and because I, I love being in the middle and everyone listened to me but then slowly I started to I started to think that it was an insecurity like it it was I'm not okay obviously I'm insecure about it but I was doing it out of insecurity and I was and I had it twisted in my head I was like man I'm just I'm just confident I just enjoy talking to people I just that's just who I am I'm just loud and I just talk a lot but it's like mm, well what's really going on here is you're insecure and you're worried that people aren't going to like you and you're trying to force people to like you you're trying to tell these stories and you're trying to be the center of attention you're trying yeah. to like command a stage because that's what why people will like you and yeah. then i found it really hard and like i'd get and I'm, man i've like i'm better at it now but like sometimes i'll meet someone and i get real talking if i just start telling stories because i'm just like oh, i gotta give them as much info as i can because i want them to like me <laughs> and it's like yeah. but now that i've again it's like that you get older you get that perspective and i don't know whether yeah. that's come from from you know doing different things but now the thing that i love about weed is that it makes me not feel like i need to talk yeah like 
but it's how ironic is it that I fucking have a podcast? Yeah. But <laughs> it's like, but that's my number one fucking insecurity in life is that like I get to this point where I, I'm like scared that people want me. It's like you're scared of silence because then yeah. it's like people are judging you in that silence. I don't know. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a weird thing. But I just assume it's a, an awkward silence. Yeah, exactly. And it's completely fine to have silence. <laughs> yeah. And that's what, that's what. I think has been the biggest help for me is you smoke and I don't feel that pressure to talk. Yeah. I'm, I'm cool. I'm cool with it. And then now that I've found that the longer that I've done that, I'm just cool with it in general. Mm-hmm. But I mean, even this trip, I noticed like I'd start, like I met all these new people. It was just a fucking overload of new people. And it's like, it's hard because you don't want to tell, you're like, you want to tell, you want to give people information about you to be like, look, we kind of like the same shit. Like we're probably going to be friends, but it's like, you, I guess sometimes, yeah, you feel like forced or rushed to like, oh, I've got to give them all this info. Mm. But there were even points this week where I was like, dude, just shut the fuck up. Just chill, man. Like it's all good. And then you see other people do the, I think it's a common thing. I don't, I don't think it's a, you know, Robinson, Robinson Crusoe when it comes to, to that. But no, I think it is a common thing. Yeah, yeah, but it's like it's it's cool to I guess know that that's like a thing. Yeah. And and yeah, it's like so I guess that's the reason that I kind of enjoy it as well because I feel like I am always the person that's talking and fucking mm. carrying on and telling stories. Sometimes it's nice to just be the dude in the corner that's kind of sitting there shutting the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't I don't know how I'd go doing one of these ripped. Yeah. Be a weird experience. But what hasn't been a weird experience is this particular podcast. I've fucking yeah. really enjoyed it. I'm glad you were able to tell your story about what you went through. Yeah, hopefully, it, you know, people, yeah, can relate to it maybe, and it's going to help them in some way and give mm. them a bit of hope. You know, if they're in a, if they are in a similar situation, mm. you know, yeah. No, I'm I'm stoked, and and I think like it's cool to bring people that. I guess people would have a certain expectation of how you are as a person based on the profile in a way. Yeah. And then uh, I'm, I'm interested to see if it matches up. I f- yeah, I think I need to, to change that. that. I use this certain photo all the time. There's a photo of me. Like, just fucking in the best jacked. Shape, the best shape I've ever been, just looking angry. That's really not who I am. No, you're, you're <laughs> I'm not like that dude. at all. It gives people a wrong idea. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, don't, I don't, it's not ne- like negative. People are fucking jacked. People walk yeah. around looking like Hulk. Yeah. But um, I guess it's just that you're in martial arts and, hmm. and that sort of thing. Like even someone said it to me the other day, like, oh, I just did not think he was a filmer because normally filmers are fucking nerds. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, it's like you've got, you've got your own thing going yeah. on. You're doing you, dude. You're, you're a unique guy in a lot of good ways. So yeah. appreciate you. your talk, man. And uh, I've, thank you. I enjoyed hanging out this week. I enjoyed getting to know you a bit and, and the training we did today and the stuff you've taught me through the week. It's, it's, it's cool that, you know, little like the double under thing little things that you yeah. showed me like i'll keep that for the oh that's rest stick of the time with you now. Yeah, yeah rest of the time i'm doing jujitsu yeah. it's kind of like it stuck with me since i think purple belt i'm still doing it now let's not tell anyone yeah no because <laughs> i fucking like that <laughs> shit. A good one all right brother i appreciate it yeah yeah cool thank you brother done <laughs>